I think it's now time for... It's not time for that. He's at a 12, and I need him at a 3. I'm good. All right, Jensen, you're the captain. Yay. Hamburger in the house. <laughs> <laughs> I will pick you up and twirl you around. We got off on a tangent there. We always do. I'm not, I'm done touching it. He's going to step into the shed here. No, that we don't have a shed. No, that's stupid. What? what that's my old that? podcast. We, have a, we don't have a shed. I'm sorry. You're going to step <laughs> the out shed. <laughs> Calm down. Trademark infringement. Who are you? Put your pants on. Okay, dude. <laughs> Whatever, bro. <laughs> this is why you're not a world power anymore. <laughs> you British. <laughs> <laughs> Can't say that. <laughs> Could you not? Could you not? Some grace and decorum, please. Oh, that's going to show up in the episode. <laughs> Hello everyone and welcome to episode 63 of the Plastic Posse podcast. I am joined, as always, by my absolutely beautiful co-hosts. Starting from the West Coast, we have Mr. Grant Mabry. How the devil are you, sir? I'm doing great. It's great to see everybody and we had all six people here today, so it's nice. Yeah, we got a full house. What's the West Coast? (laughs) It's it's a Spongebob reference. Completely ruined my flow. From the West Coast, we had Grant. Now heading inland a little bit, we have... Scott Gentry from Utah. How's it going, everybody? We are all fantastic. I'll answer for them because they're all muted. We also have back with us after being absent from last week, Mr. Doug Smith. How are you, sir? I'm doing very well. Thank you very much. Superb. Now heading over the Rockies, we have Mr. John Bonani, Mr. High Life, Mr. Mountain Man indeed. How are you doing? Absolutely fantastic. That is great to hear. Heading over to the Commonwealth of Virginia, we have TJ Haller. How are you? Good, I see you saved the best for last, so thank you. Absolutely, I mean, I'm lost, actually. So, obviously, I'm Jensen, I'm in England, which says everything uh, you need to know. So, yeah, it's great to have everyone back for this full episode. A full episode? A full cast episode. So, what's everyone been working on? We're going to go backwards, so we'll start again with TJ. What's been on your bench? Well, just today, I finished the 65 millimeter French Foreign Legion uh, Soldier from Wars and Pieces. Um, I actually don't even think I talked about that last episode because I don't think I had started it yet. Yep, I finished that up today. Took some pictures of it. It looked really nice. <laughs> of course, Ian made some nice face apps with it, which uh, <laughs> was actually pretty funny. Yeah, that's that's the main thing. Um, I've got a Mindwork Studios bus that I just just mounted and took a picture of. Might get that in the primer. And then I've got the FT. Um, I'm going to finish building that maybe this weekend and get on with that. Very nice. Did you think of a name for the figure? No. Because all of my friends think they're comedians. And uh, when I solicited advice, I didn't get any serious answers. So I decided to screw it and I just put it into the cabinet and I'll revisit that later. So I'm sure something will come <laughs> up. Yeah, hardy har har. Well done. <laughs> Comedic genius. I don't know how I do it. JB, what's been on your bench? Oh, man. My bench has been. Lacking lately, I started the Mooseroo Cup finally. I went from a dusted box to uh, some sprues being cut and some paint being slung, so I can give an update on that later. And then I was out of town this week, but I received the new Panzer L70A from Tamiya via Scott and the fine folks over at Tamiya USA. So that's going to be an exciting project that I will rip uh, over the next few days. Very nice. Living up to the title, Mr. High Life. Mr. Scott Gentry, what's on your bench? 
Yeah, the actual modeling has slowed down a little bit. Been doing quite a bit of 3D printing. I've been printing a model for our good friend, Aaron Cook. Finally got through that and I think I've overcome a lot of challenges I've been having there. So that's great. And then just a lot of great stuff with the podcast. You know, last week we had, as JB mentioned, that really exciting a gift from Tamiya USA. So we were kind of dealing with that and, you know, I had a podcast to drop. So, you know, just kind of a very, very busy, uh, busy week week. We're recording this actually a little bit early because later in the month, several of us are going to shows. And so we've got to get our schedules all, all kind of done, but you know, just doing that. And then just, uh, having, having a great time, you know, uh, last episode was a lot of fun. We implemented some changes and I think we all really liked them. I certainly did. And it was uh, awesome, of course, to, to catch up with our favorite uncle Martin. That was a, a great conversation. I'm still kind of buzzing about that. He's always a lot of fun to talk to, but he was, I think, particularly engaged. So anyway, that's what I've been working on. Very nice, very productive, and busy as always. Doug, how about you? Well, I've been uh, doing a little more work on my B-Wing that I'm building for a friend of mine. Um, I've mentioned it before. He he re- operates a reptile room locally, and he's a big Star Wars fan. And I gave him a hard time that this reptile room has nothing Star Wars in it, so I'm building him a, a B-Wing. I've been working on the base, which is going to be kind of like a Red Rocks hoodoos from uh, Bryce Canyon National Park, something like that, that it'll be flying past. Other than that, I was feeling a little down and feeling like I had no interest in modeling last week. And then it occurred to me, it wasn't that I had no interest in modeling. It's that I wasn't working on a tank. And that's so weird because until last year, I'd built like one tank in 25 years. And last year I did seven. There you go. So I pulled out a little Hobby Boss 48 scale uh, T3485 and I've got it just about ready for primer now. Um, had a lot of fun. Just just put it together. It's not going to be anything special, but it was just nice to have one of those going together. And as much as I love airplanes and building airplanes and seeing built up airplanes, I love building tanks. They're just they're just great. It just it just brought me so much joy last year. I'm going to keep doing it. That's amazing to hear. Good to have you back. Thank you. And Mr. Mayberry, what have you been doing? I uh, finished my Civil War officer today. He's based up, ready to go to Seattle. Worked on a couple small figures, say uh, like a vampire kind of figure, working on a base for that. Other than that, I've been uh, playing around with uh, a recommendation that TJ gave us, which is the Scale Color Artist Smooth Acrylic Paints that come in like um, uh, like oils containers. They, they are so nice. Uh, they are really, really nice. Um, I'm started trying to figure out how to use them right now, but they they lay so smooth and flat for skin tones and colors, and they're just beautiful. Um, they're really nice. So that's what I've been working on. Oh, yeah, and I also built a 113 that I have sitting over here. I still need to paint. That's about it. Oh, lovely. Sounds like we've all had a very uh, very productive week. Obviously. What have you What have you been working on? Oh, yeah, me. I forgot I did this. I forgot I'm a modeler. So I've actually been doing stuff. I started uh, mainly because I've, every time I'm in a Discord with, with Zach and Jackson, they're like, so, uh, <laughs> so are you doing any modeling tonight and i'm always there like nah i can't be bothered and i got a little bored of them asking so i said right i need to pick something i know we're all working on rhomboids at the minute but i i really am struggling with the mark IV female it's just it's not a great kit so uh i'm not working on that anymore so i decided to pick the tack and blitz uh stug slash stew uh, early production it's a blitz kit so it should be relatively uh short a small part count. It should be a nice, quick, simple build. In essence, it is. It's the the kit is ninety nine percent done now. I just need to add the left hand side uh, armor supports and the left toe cable and the tracks. But apart from that, the actual kits together, it's a lovely little kit. Like blitz by nature, you can get them done in like one day if you really put your mind to it. Really nice. The engineering's not sublime, but that's the kind of nature of these kits. They're designed to be put together quite quick. So, uh, yeah, one more little session, that build's going to be finished, and then I can get it into primer, and then I can move on to a new subject, because as soon as I get to the painting stage, I tend to just lose interest in, in modeling for some reason. So if I can overcome that hurdle, that'd be nice. But yeah, I've actually been working on Attack and Stug, which is really cool. They are lovely little kits. So guys, I think it's time we go into our first discussion point. And I have Grant to thank for this one because I was kind of really struggling for for things to, to talk about. And it's, I don't kind of want to repeat the same things uh, that we have discussed in the past. But this one is that is jumping from scale to scale or subject to subject a good thing or a bad thing? And before I even give my opinion on this, I kind of want you guys to go first. Um, I think I think it's actually a really good question. I definitely have my own thoughts on this. But yeah, let's just 
kind of go around the room and gather your thoughts on on this. Grant, we oh, don't mind. Oh no, we'll start with T, uh, TJ. Put it himself. We'll go with TJ. I, I don't have to go first, Grant. If you would like to go, <laughs> okay, then I'll start. Um, yeah, because I think going from scale to scale and subject subject is awesome. I've never understood single scale modelers or single subject modelers. I mean, I if you want to do that, fine. But man, you're missing out on like so much awesome stuff. It just, to me, it just doesn't make sense. If you limit yourself to like 172nd scale aircraft or 135th scale tanks, like that's all you do. Like there's more out there and there's really, really, really good stuff. And to like choose not to enjoy any of it because it's quote, not the right scale. I don't know. That just doesn't make any sense to me. It's just, you're, you're placing artificial limits on your hobby that it doesn't need. That doesn't mean you build everything, but if you, you see it all the time, when a new kit gets released and someone's like well not the right scale no how about get that one and build it and and enjoy it if it's a subject you like there's no reason not not to i mean sure if it's huge and it's expensive that's different i you know i'm just like anyone else i'm not gonna buy a 600 hundred dollar kit because i don't want to and that's a lot of money you know what i mean it's, but i'm not gonna buy it because it's not the right scale I'm, I'm not gonna buy it because financially it doesn't make sense to me to spend that much money on on some plastic so yeah like i kind of get that but yeah and, and as far as subject the subject goes i think i think it's pretty obvious that I'm, i strive to be a pretty well-rounded modeler you know, i like armor i like figures i like science fiction i even like airplanes i've done one I, i'm going to do more i have more yeah i don't know i, I just think it's kind of silly to limit yourself but if it makes you happy i mean I, i'm not saying anyone has to enjoy the hobby the way i do just from my perspective i just yeah i don't know it doesn't make any sense to me <laughs> TJ, I'm looking forward to seeing your uh, your 148 scale P38, the Tamiya P38 that you have. I want to see I, what you do with that. I'm going to build that. I really, I, <laughs> I've been saying that since we started this podcast, but I'm going to build it. I it, I feel like it it migrates closer and closer to like the front of the stack behind me as I'm like picking stuff up. I'm like, oh, well, you know, this is the, the P38. I could, I could build this. And I'm like, no, it's just. I'll put it right here. So yeah. Now whether or not I'm going to do it this year, I don't know. But I, I really want to. It's like, damn, I love the P38. It's such a cool airplane. I'm with you, TJ. I mean, this actually, this idea came from a, a discussion I had with a couple friends of mine online, and, and it was kind of interesting because they're a little bit older, like I am, and they were talking about when when they were younger, it was easier to be focused in a, a scale and a subject because the quality of kits at that time was not what it is now. We don't have the, they didn't have the accessories, but now it's, there's no, no reason to be specific to any scale or genre because there is so much out there. If you look at, just look at the new releases that we're seeing coming from Nuremberg right now. You, you have the, the, the new Tamiya, the Tamiya kits, the M40, the M8 and 148 scale. The, you know, the new pans are from them. You look at, you know, AK with their Unimogs and their Land Rovers and their Jeeps. And then you, then you turn and you look at, you know, Hobby Boss with some fantastic 172nd scale vehicles and trucks. And then you, you, you know, it's just, it's everything is out there and everything is available and to pigeonhole and yourself to one scale, one genre, you're missing out on so much. In my opinion, you're going to be a better modeler. If you, if you jump around in my opinion, because you're going to see different paint qualities, different paint styles, different products, even, you know, that different genres use. I mean, you know, I'd love to build cars one day because I see some car modelers out there, especially here in Southern California, where, the paint jobs look like you could push your hand through it and it would just be like cream and it looks like a real car and it's unbelievable. I'm like you, TJ. I think it's just, you know, it's so much out there and so much you can enjoy that I think everybody should just reach out and, you know, see what else is out there. You know, Grant, you make some really good points there and TJ as well. The last two, you know, I generally build armor and 135th scale, like, you know, a lot of armor modelers do, but the last two tanks I've built have been uh 172nd scale. I did a T28 for a 72 hour group build. And now I'm working on a 116th scale kit. And to be honest, all three scales really give you kind of different things that you can do. This Panzer that I'm working on, I'm working on a lot of 
you know, texturing and, and adding some missing weld beads and some things that I wouldn't always necessarily add in 135th scale. And you, and then conversely, the 72nd scale, yeah, I was able to put together a Soviet T-28 start to finish in 72 hours. And, you know, that obviously would have been a little bit difficult with a 135th scale. And I, I enjoyed I enjoyed both of these projects as much as any 135th. So um, like you guys, I'm scale agnostic. Uh, subjects we kind of like what we like I, I think i think it's good the other thing that we haven't really hit on yet is um i think if you do too much of one thing that you really i think you run the risk maybe of getting to that burnout feeling or that kind of down in the doldrums feeling where it's like you know oh geez here we go again with road wheels and you know maybe it's time to get get a figure out or get a sci-fi you know subject out and so I think from that standpoint, at least for me, I'm not speaking for anyone else, um, having a little bit of variety in what I'm building and, and what I'm approaching for me really helps keep projects fresh and moving moving down the bench. So anyway, that's that's what I think. Totally agree with that. Thinking about when I talked about what I'm building right now and the, the, the need to go to a piece of armor, well, I'm building 48 scale. 35th scale is is more aesthetically pleasing to me. And the size is is perfect, but man, the 48 scale kits are just fun to build. And so they can work as a palette cleanser for you. You know, if you were to say just the scale, you kind of miss out on that. And I love 48 scale aircraft, but if I stuck to 48 scale aircraft, I'd be denying myself the Arma Hobby line that, that's out now. All those 72nd scale kits are incredible. So why would I, why would I want to pigeonhole myself into one of those? those scales when, when it just, there's just so many different things to build. And I've allowed myself to do things that I haven't done before. And that's made me enjoy my hobby more and find things that I really enjoy that I couldn't have found if I had just said, no, I'm not going to do that. It's the wrong subject, the wrong scale. Yeah. I think for me, I'm going to echo my co-hosts and I mean, maybe we can prove this by taking a picture of your stash and throwing it online. I was just thinking, you go downstairs, you look at my stash, you'll find a predominance of 135th scale armored vehicles. But what else will you find? You'll see Horizon Dinosaurs from Jurassic Park. You'll see a Japanese uh, shrine. You'll see random sci-fi vehicles, everything from, you know, Star Destroyers to uh, Machining Krieger to, I have a spook figure that was from, you know, the Phantom, the, the F4 Phantom little mascot guy. So I think my stash is pretty reminiscent of my taste, which is all over the place, uh, kind of like food, I guess. And really, it's uh, sometimes I have a craving for I always have a craving for French fries. I'll be honest. That's why I'm never wearing skinny jeans. Um, but I like that. I like Chinese food. I like Thai food. I like barbecue. I like it all. And it's kind of like the same with modeling too, where there's a few things I don't like. I'll say there's a few things that I limit exposure to, uh, you know, one of which is cars. I, I, I'm trying to think I, I have the Batmobile, uh, the Tumblr, which is probably the closest thing to a car. But, you know, other than that, I, I but I appreciate it. I think Tamiya's cars are drop dead gorgeous. And I have a dream one day of building the Mercedes SLS or even a Ferrari Enzo because the lines on those are absolutely gorgeous. And if I can afford it, maybe a Ming GT, uh, GT, what is it? GT 40, the Ford. So again, I think I'm just echoing what, what all of you have said, where, you know, variety is the spice of life and scale modeling is certainly one of the hobbies that you can experience that in. And, you know, and, and I'll, I'll be honest, I know some people that only build a certain subject, a certain scale, and, and they're super happy. So it kind of gets back to what we've all said too. If that's what you do, cool man uh, or or woman, cool cool person. I love it all. And and again, it'll strike me in a vendor room. I'll be walking around, and then somebody will be like, "Man, that's cool." It's like, okay, I better buy that. I mean, a testament to this is a thirty fifth scale U boat segment just showed at my house this week. A year ago, two years ago, probably wouldn't have been on my radar, but it's like, I see it. I want it. I'm a grown up. I'm going to have it. So I, I think, I think model companies are starting to realize that, you know, JB mentioned that uh, subsection. And then another really great example is some of the things that TACOM are doing. Um, you know, I've got the uh, 135th scale twin five inch gun turret. You know, those are really, really popular. We've seen airships and blimps, you know, even gun towers. I mean, so yeah, I, th I think, uh, you know, that variety, um, I think a lot of uh, JB just held up that subsection. My goodness, that is large. 
a- anyway, I, I think uh, model companies are, are, you know, tapping into that and then, uh, you know, go over to our friend uh, Andy over at MBK and some of what they're doing. Look at, look at our choices in say one sixteenth scale armor now versus five years ago. It's amazing. You stole exactly what I was going to say, Scott, about oh. TACOM. I mean, exactly. You even reference, reference, you called it a blimp. It's not a blimp. There's Zeppelins, and I'm not being pedantic, but there is an actual difference between a blimp and a Zeppelin. I just wanna, I want, want to throw that out there. But yes, the Zeppelins. I didn't know I wanted a Zeppelin kit until I saw TACOM make a freaking Zeppelin kit. And I have one, thanks to Grant, who sent me one. Out of the kindness of his heart. And it is awesome. And Grant, I that's one I really want to build that thing so much. They're so cool. And this isn't a case of one of those things where, you know, they they made it so people wanted to, to build those. You know, you've heard that being thrown around before. I think Zeppelins are cool because they're World War One. They're freaking weird. And it, 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 there's kits of them and they're they're pretty cool. <laughs> It, it look at just like you mentioned, this is the random crap that Tacom comes out with. I also didn't know I wanted a dual mount five inch turret, but then I bought one. I'm like, man, this thing's freaking sweet, you know. And when when like they f- came out with the first one, I think it, I think they did a 172nd scale Yamato, the big one. It was out of the Bismarck. I can't I can't remember which one they did first. And I saw that. I'm like, who the hell would want that? I'm like, whatever. At 72 scale, of course, these turrets are massive in real life. And I'm like, yeah, whatever. And then they more started coming out. And I'm like, man, I don't know. That is <laughs> that is kind of cool. And then that dual mount, I was like, that is, that's sweet. I, I do like that. And then they have the Missouri guns. And I, I get it. They got me. Hook, line, sinker. Yeah, I, I tell you what, there's a, I can't remember if it's Tacom or not, but someone's doing a 1700, or is it a 1700, 1700, no, 1350 scale dry dock for ships. That is the coolest thing I have ever seen. I mean, it's a lot of photo etch, but it looks so cool put together. Yeah. I, there, there's the float, no the way. Floating dry dock? Yeah, there's yeah. no way I would have ever thought about that. And I was like, now I'm like, oh God, I got to have that. It's crazy. I mean, look what Jensen and I bought at the Nats, a V1 with a launching rail. The thing is massive. And I would have never predicted it. So it kind of goes back, TACOM, Border, you know, even Ryefield. I admire, especially TACOM, like you, like you all said, wh- who needs a flat bunker? Well, I need one now. Uh, <laughs> you know, look at Jackson, our friend, and the subjects that they come out with, I'm appreciative that they're taking the risk because in a traditional company at the marketing meeting, they'd be like, yeah, no, we're not going to do that because there's no research on it. There's no basis for why this would be successful. And they threw that caution to the wind and, like, like TJ said, the Zeppelin's great, the turrets, the, the, the hypersonic missile too. Like it's, it's cool. Uh, and it's, and I think those pieces are models that you can honestly put in like a bookcase and it's, or a, on a desk. It's, it's like a different type of model in some regard too. Uh, and I, Hey, tack on, keep replacing them. I'll keep, I'll keep sharing my credit card information with you. The Sergeant York. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. Oh, Whatever that thing rules, I don't care. What yes, it does. Yeah, they're yeah. they're cool. the coolest. That's the coolest vehicle. Yeah. Don't forget DOS work in there too. A one seventy second World War One German sub. I mean, with yeah. a dry dock, you can get the dry dock and the figures and all that. Oh, it's amazing. Hobby's dying, so I, I'm not sure <laughs> what's going on. Yes, yeah, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> It's kind of hard for me to add anything to what you guys have said, really. I, for me, very much, I know what I like. I know my scale. I know my subject. It's something I, sp- I spoke with Spencer Pollard about this kind of a, at the Bolton show recently about when we're kind of having a struggle or whatever and we want something different to build. But then someone, someone will say, oh, build something completely different that you'd never build. And we're both like, no, we don't build them for a reason. We don't like them. But it's like, I, I completely understand why people like build something you would never do because you might enjoy it and it's completely fresh. You might learn some new skills. It's a different subject. It's it's a different discipline but i'm very much of i in the camp of i i know the subjects i like i don't care what the scale is kind of what tj said i'll i'm not limited by that sort of stuff only kind of by space i would love a 30 second scale lancaster where am i going to put it i have absolutely no idea that's the only reason i don't have one so yeah i'm very much subject driven rather than scale driven so if i like it and it's only released in one scale even if it's a weird like we're going to release this model in 163 scale makes no sense but i will buy it if it's the only choice and it's a subject i love yeah i think one thing we forgot to hit on too it's not only manufacturers but the prevalence of 3D printing and the options mm-hmm. that you have for custom designs, 
figures, sci-fi. I mean, the one person we were we follow on Patreon, TJ introduced him to us, the bust, the bust fellow. All the sci-fi fantasy, you know, Marvel characters that you can 3D print at home. Doug, I know, has printed a lot of them. Photos gorgeous. Photos yeah, Photos Smith. Yeah, Photos Smith. Exactly. Another great example where I'm not a figure guy, I'm not a bust guy by any means, but in this case, for Photos Man, I'm in, and I, I love his releases. I'm assuming it's a him. Again, awesome work that I never knew I needed until I saw it, and I needed it. Phrasing, yeah. JB. <laughs> yeah, oh, look at that. Little <laughs> <laughs> he just stole a Q-tip. That's what happened to your M4 right there. That's right. <laughs> you know, you you bring you bring up another point, uh, JB. You made me think of this is as as gaming pieces and modeling gaming pieces, Rubicon models, Star Wars Legion models. As those kind of become more and more integrated in the community, um, some of those are really really nice models. You know, a bunch of us did some of those for our forty eight and forty eight last year. I plan on doing it again this year. Some of those little Rubicon model armor pieces, they're fantastic, and so. Um, again, if if you limit yourself, oh uh, yeah, yeah, Grant's got a nice one right there. Yeah, uh, you know why limit yourself? Again, if it's something that's that's great, go for it. Yeah, the Legion ones are super nice. They're one forty seventh scale, I think, so close enough to forty eighth. I love them. They're great. Yeah, Rubicon is just they've come out with the started to come out with a Vietnam line, so they got the BTR sixties, the T fifty fours, the T fifty fives. They uh, they have uh, Hueys. They're coming out with an M113 line, M48 line for their games. And they, they I, I held up a M BTR60 a second ago. But, you know, these are their beautiful kits. I mean, they're they're a kit. They're not just a something you throw on the table. They are a kit. Uh, dear dear Tacom, could could we please have some 116th scale World War II motorcycle kits, a Harley Davidson, an Indian, a Triumph, please? That is all. Thank you. So thanks, guys. I think that's uh, that provides quite a good input into that discussion. I do. I would absolutely love to know what uh, all our listeners think in, in in regards to uh, the change of scale and change of subject, and what what you all think. Like, is it th- something that you like to do, or are you very much rigid and solid within your lanes? You know what you like, you know what your scale is, and you stick to that purely. So yeah, it'd be, it'd be great to hear back from everyone regarding that. One thing that JB mentioned before that I really want to kind of question him on is how that Musaru Cup build is doing. Because I know it's been dusty for a while. Well, it's uh, accelerated exponentially within the last two weeks. I was out this week for work, but prior to leaving, I had the opportunity to start a really nice little kit. And I sat down in the morning and I had sprues. And in the afternoon, I had a cockpit finished, uh, painted. I need to do a little weathering on it, but it's it's really nice. I think I am going to go with a natural metal finish, you know, armor guy doing something new. I thought, now I, I'm curious to... to how, how much would I break the internet if I did one wing olive drab and the rest of it natural metal and combine the markings in the box? Because it's technically out of the box. My co-host faces right now, Scott's like, dude, don't do that. You sound st- <laughs> You, I hear what you're saying, and you sound stupid right now. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just kind of ruminating. But yeah, I guess uh, as long as the uh, schemes are on the back of the box, you could do. Don't like do it. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Don't do it. Don't do it. All right, I'll stick with all natural metal. We know what aircraft modelers are like to begin with. <laughs> Don't find a reason to upset them further. <laughs> Oh, man. No. So all joking aside, I, I'll do natural metal, not looking to be secretive about it. I'll post updates when I go through. Uh, I'll be doing natural metal, the invasion stripes, and I'm pretty sure I got to mask those. Not a problem. I have some LP11, and I'm probably going to tap into Brian Kreiner's knowledge for natural metal finishes because his are awesome. But no, bottom line is, again, very thankful IPMS Hamilton, the folks that put on the Musser Cup. Really, really nice of them to send it all to us. Gorgeous little kit. Really excited to finish it. If you don't have an Armor Hobbies kit, TJ's built the Yak. He can testify. They are gorgeous little kits. I know Jensen has one. I, again, I'm not an aircraft guy, but the kit itself, the engineering, the quality, and then just the instruction manual and the the decal sheet, incredibly well done. And and hats off to Armor, another manufacturer that's kind of turning the turning the tide on on the opinions of 70 second scale kits i think because gosh it's it rivals 30 second scale detail in terms of the decals the the features in the in the cockpit so i'm excited to to continue it and it's it's gone a lot quicker than i thought so this weekend it's all attention to the l70a but i will get back to the mooser cup and she should be uh she should be done within time nice i always love to see people tackle aircraft 
especially one uh, modelers who aren't used to them because i i i don't want to say i'm an aircraft modeler but i've done lots of them since i started so i know it's different it's a different discipline so i'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what you do I'm, I'm still worried about this natural metal finish to be honest i gotta talk to brian kreiner about it there's polishing involved and, and i'll be honest here's the other thing you know the thing that confuses me, and this is going to sound really dumb, but decals on top of natural metal finish. Like, do you clear before? Do you clear after? I, I, it's, I'm being dead honest. I don't have a good way of doing it. I have Spencer Pollard's book, which I've looked through, and he talks about using, uh, to me, a clear thin down a lot. Uh, Brian Kreiner is a future fan, which isn't around, and I don't have any. So I, uh, I'm following, to be honest, Plug in Spencer again, his to me a Mustang book, top notch, following a lot of the techniques he talks about in there when it comes to natural metal finish, type of weathering you put on it with burnt umber, and then also Payne's Gray. I have a tube of Payne's Gray I bought like seven years ago because of him mentioning it, and I finally get to use it. Bottom line, uh, we'll we'll see what happens. And then I have a I have a little unique base plan for it. Yeah, it should be good. I'm excited to see everybody else's as well. I I think I was one of the last people to start, but hopefully not the last to finish. Nice. Whilst I have you. Tell us about that new Tamiya kit. Yeah, great question, Jensen. The Panzer IV 70A, gorgeous kit. I think what surprises me the most about it is the price point. You know, the original L70, it lists in the United States for like 69 bucks. It's really expensive. But I think Tamiya, I don't know if they've, you know, tweaked their prices for their new releases, but it, it falls in line with the KV, the Comet, 51 bucks. Super cheap, built out of the box, no question at all. The armor texture, again, I'm, I'm looking at it in person. I think it's actually really, really well done. I think once paint's on it, once weathering's on it, it's going to look absolutely fantastic. The Toma Shields photo etch, again, it's high marks to Tamiya. And, I, and I'm not just saying that. I, I'm probably going to buy at least two more of these kits because it's one of my favorite vehicles from World War II because it's one of just one of the most unique. And reading about the vehicle too, about why the superstructure is higher because they didn't relocate the fuel tanks on the floor and they had to raise the superstructure in order to compensate for the size of the gun and the fighting compartment. So just a really unique uh, vehicle, unique camouflage scheme. And there's actually a really well-preserved example of a roof plate uh, that has like a vibrant red brown and a really vibrant um dunkel gelb of course but also the the uh, olive green so I i'm super excited to get started after we're done recording tonight i will go all out on finishing this thing and i will have it in primer by tomorrow night mark my words i'm just really impressed with not just this kit jb but also the the m18 and the comet that you mentioned the kv1 and kv2 before that to me is it, it seems to me has really made an effort to kind of go back and come out with a kit of uh, the stewart is the same way that they released you know two or three years back to come out with a kit that i think appeals to a really wide audience there's a lot more detail and texture than used to be there but if, if you want to add aftermarket and everything you can you can go ahead and do that but you know at a price that's really about two-thirds of what a really good high-end Rifield or TACOM or a Dragon kit's going to cost you, you're going to be able to get Tamiya Engineering, Tamiya Plastic, and you know, fifty-one dollars for a brand new tooled model kit that has a whole sheet of photo etch in it, it is a tremendous value. I mean, most people are going to be able to go down to their local hobby shop and get into that kit for a little more than forty bucks. And I think in 2023, there's a lot of people talking about how pricing is gone up and and my hats are off to Tamiya for the value that they're delivering in these 135th scale kits. Yeah, I, I, Scott, I agree too. And I think another great thing that Tamiya has done over the last couple of years is their their figures. Um, their figures have jumped such to a great quality. And, I, you know, the faces on them, they're scanning, you know, real people and putting their faces on these figures. They're scanning them. You know, the, the recent uh, U.S. reconnaissance team, that is probably one of the it, well, it is the best plastic figure set I think you can buy out there right now. Now they are they did also um, show that they have a German uh, set coming out now too that was just went off. So like like you said, you know, seventeen bucks for you know recon team of five figures. Eh, maybe maybe you have to add a resin head, but not the ones I've seen. Like, you don't need to do it, but they're great figures. And, you know, another, you know, tank out there too from Tamiya is the R35. R35 is 25 bucks. That is a fantastic kit. It is a fun kit. It is an easy kit and you'll enjoy every second of that build. Again, my hat's off from too. Yeah. The Kenton cried cost me, I think 20 bucks and uh, I've done the build. I haven't painted it yet, but um, enjoyed every second of it. I mean, just 
again, I think to me is providing incredible value. So um, I'm really looking forward to JB doing that and getting that built and done within the next hour. So one thing I want to mention before we move on to our special interview segment is the Plastic Pussy Young Guns. Uh, myself, Zach Grizzle and Jackson Stanton are, are kind of rolling in hard on the YouTube thing. So we won't say too much about what, what it is. Uh, we're going to try and keep it all consistent and regular and professional and good. Uh, so yeah, just, just keep your eye out on the Plastic Posse podcast YouTube channel. That's where all the, the content's going to be going. It's going to be great. We're a good team. There's great chemistry. It's going to be a lot of fun. Well, we're looking forward to that, Jensen. And, uh, you know, we've been uh, wanting to do some video content for a while. So uh, hopefully you guys are bringing in some some fun and some little bit different, you know, having the video aspect to it. So we're excited to see what that's like. Oh, yeah, it's going to be marvelous. I think it's time for a word from our sponsor. The Plastic Posse podcast is sponsored by Tankcraft. In addition to their awesome cutting mats, Tankcraft also makes some incredible scale modeling tools for your workbench. Want to keep extra thin cement off your bench and in the bottle where it belongs? Check out Tankcraft Glue Base, designed to stop glue spills in their tracks. The glue base is made from solid mill aluminum and comes with a stable rubber base pad and can accommodate most square and round cement bottles. And while you're there, check out their line of cutting mats and other unique modeling tools. Remember, Posse listeners get 15% off their first order by using the code POSSE15. So head on over to tankcraft.com. That's T-A-N-K-R-A-F-T dot com. Thanks, Jensen. Up next, we have Jeremy Moore, good friend and a great modeler, stops by to talk about how he got into the hobby, where he is today, and where we can find his work. So sit back, buckle up, and enjoy the ride. All right, listeners, we have a special guest with us this episode. We have the Jeremy Moore from Scale Model Projects by Jeremy Moore on Facebook. You've seen him in print, you've seen him online, and we're so happy he's here to talk with us. He's got a great background, a really diverse modeling collection, and we just cannot wait to get into who he is, what he does, and learn a little bit about his, his style because Lord knows I love it. So Jeremy, how's it going tonight? Going well. Thanks for uh, for having me, guys. I appreciate it. Thanks, JB. Glad to be here. Oh, we've been trying to set this up for a while and so happy it's worked out tonight. With me, I also have Scott. How's it going, everybody? Jeremy sounds great, man. Nice uh, podcast voice. <laughs> Thank you. And then also we have Grant with us tonight from California. Hey, everybody. I'm glad that everybody could join us today. Nice to meet you, Jeremy. Can't wait. This will be fun. Same here. Yeah, looking forward to it. All right, Jeremy, buckle up. You're in the interrogation chair. I mean, interview chair. So in the hot seat. Uh, in the hot seat. <laughs> First question we're going to go with, you know, just to get us started, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself. How'd you start modeling and how, how it came about and w what it took you to where you are today? Yeah, I grew up in uh, in Western New York, just south of Buffalo, uh, small town. And I had a, uh, I have an older brother, actually my oldest brother, who's an engineer. He was always very big into uh, radio controlled airplanes, still is. Uh, and he was a big inspiration for me when I, I got started. There's a good age difference. He's 12 years older than I am. Uh, so I followed him, you know, to every radio controlled model airplane meet that he went to and kind of was, was his helper. And at some point, I picked up a plastic model kit uh, when I was probably, I don't know, eight or nine years old. And, you know, as mo most people say, the rest is history. I just uh, loved building models. You know, I couldn't get my hands on enough of them. And then at some point, probably a couple of years later, I found a, a copy of Military Modeler magazine. That kind of set me down the road of of, uh, of building mostly armor projects. And uh, yeah, going back to the radio control thing, that's that kind of led me into my love for aviation. And that's what started me uh, when I was a, a teenager. When I was 16, I took my first flying lesson. Uh, I got my private pilot's license at 17, decided, hey, this is cool. And I want to do this for a living. You know, looked at options as far as going into the military, you know, become a, uh, a commercial airline pilot. I was pretty impatient. I uh, didn't want to wait, didn't want to do the military thing. So I just kept going. I had my private pilot's license when I started college. Uh, I went to school out in the Midwest, 
the University of Central Missouri and the small aviation program there. Uh, continue to get my ratings. It's kind of interesting. I did not get an aviation degree. My my bachelor's degree was actually in computer computer aided drafting and computer aided manufacturing, which I have never used <laughs> since I graduated in. May of 1996. I have never uh, opened up AutoCAD or anything since then. So I, I just knew that I wanted to be a pilot. So I, I was doing my my thing, um, get my ratings. I became a flight instructor while I was still in college, you know, and then was teaching. I did that for a year after I graduated and then just kind of caught the industry at the right time, right place and was hired by a regional airline, a computer airline called Continental Express, a uh, subsidiary of Continental Airlines. Did that for five years. Flew the ATR 42 and 72, uh, the EMB 120, both turboprops, and then the uh, ERG 145. And then I got hired by Continental Airlines with perfect timing in the industry in June of 2001, right before September 11th. So I finished training on the Boeing 737 in uh, August of 2001. And then obviously September 11th happened. And October 1st, I was promptly furloughed <laughs> and sent back to Continental Express and then uh, came back to Continental. I was recalled in 2008 uh, and then we merged with United. So I've, I've been flying the, the 737 for, oh geez, 13, oh, 15 years now, I guess, since being recalled. So I got I to gotta go back and double tap on Buffalo and it's not because of today's events. <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> I had my Bill shirt on and I had to change it because it was just too painful. I couldn't. <laughs> oh, yeah. So Buffalo growing up, you know, near there. So I grew up Western PA, a little South of Erie, Pennsylvania. So we're okay. probably not yep. too far away. When did you leave Buffalo? And do you remember hobby shops from Buffalo? Um, yeah. So we left, we moved down to the Catskills when I was, I guess, going into like seventh or eighth grade. Okay. But there was a, a hobby shop in Depew okay. called Depew Hobby Center. Uh, I remember that one. There was a hobby shop in Olean, New York, which is, okay. you know, south of Buffalo that we used to go to quite a bit called Wes's. I used to go there with my brother. My, my dad traveled uh, a lot and had a knack for knowing every hobby shop within 150, 200 <laughs> miles of where he lived. Uh, he was not a modeler. But he, because of my, I think my older brother's influence and then with me getting involved, we just, we'd be on a trip somewhere and he's like, Hey, I know where there's a hobby shop. And we, you know, sure enough, we'd pull into one and it was just, he was, he was cool with just kind of knowing where all of them were. There was a place near Binghamton, New York. We used to go to all the time called George's huge RC shop, but they also had a huge plastic model section. So yeah, it's just nice. Yeah. I, I didn't know if you ever hit up, uh, there was Niagara hobby as well. Kind of a oh, yeah. staple yep. in Buffalo with the caboose and yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And it, Really good shop. And then if you ever make it back today, I don't know if you still have family in the area, there's Section 8 hobbies. Section 8, you, yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's really good. I've been meaning to, uh, most of my family still lives up there. My mom. Uh, oh, nice. A couple of my brothers, my sister. So I've been meaning to hit up Section 8 sometime. Highly recommended. Yeah. Really br bring an extra bag. I mean, you're a pilot, so you get that for free. It's not like yeah. Jensen who has to pay $4,000 to get his stuff back. So, <laughs> but that's awesome. Okay. Teeing up, you know, where you are professionally, where you, where you're at, you know, when did you start when, I guess there's a moment in a lot of modelers, I think life where maybe they get serious and a good example is maybe getting published. I consider kind of getting serious. Sure. Yeah. When did, when did that moment hit for you? So, um, like, like most people, I, I modeled a lot in high school and then went to college, didn't have time for it. Um, and then when I when I got that first airline job, I started to have some disposable income. And and then I, I actually took a uh, position as a management pilot. So I was supervising pilots, working in an office part-time, flying part-time. The guy across the hall from me in the, the operations area was the maintenance manager for the airline in in the base and on his desk he had a Tamiya uh 132nd F4 Phantom uh in USS Midway squadron colors and we were chatting one day pilots and mechanics have this weird relationship where we like each other but we don't like each other you know it's always the the stupid F and pilots and the stupid F and mechanics and <laughs> We we go back and forth in terms of uh, who knows what they're doing and who doesn't know what they're doing. And it's it's a love hate relationship. So we had developed this relationship where he would come to my door and pound on my door and ah, one of your effing pilots did this. And, you know, I would respond a couple of days later. Ah, one of your effing mechanics did this. But that airplane, I sat down, I said, hey, did you build that? And he goes, oh, yeah, yeah, that's that's a hobby of mine. And we became instant friends. And that for me, that was probably 
1998, we, we became instant friends. He said, Hey, there's a big hobby show here in New Jersey. Let's find out when it is and let's go. And we, we went that year. The show is Mosquito Con, uh, hosted by New Jersey IPMS. Great show, great group of guys, great club. My friend, Jim, we have gone to that show every year with the exception of maybe one or two years since that, uh, that day. He has always pushed me. I've always pushed him in terms of projects and, um, you know, getting things ready for the show. So that was probably the, the, the turning point for me. I got real serious. You know, I went to that show and I was like, holy cow, this opens up a whole new world of what, you know, serious modeling is and what, what you can do with a model. Two years later, I won best armor in that show. And just like absolutely floored me that it happened. And Jim kind of nudged me. He's like, yeah, that's because you're actually pretty good. And I'm like, no, I'm just a guy that builds models, you know? And he's like, no, you are. <laughs> and these guys recognize that. So that was kind of a turning point for me. And I think JB, you and I may, we may have had this conversation at Nats about, about that time frame that was like the late nineties, early two thousands. I went to Amps Nationals uh probably two, three years in a row there when it was in Maryland. Oh um, yeah, the non air conditioned small hut. In yes. The back yeah. woods of Harve de Grace where exactly men, men came, they made the pilgrimage and you know, <laughs> yeah. all crammed their fat. Nothing like hanging out room. with a bunch of middle aged men with poor hygiene. I mean that, that, that's that what was always the, the, the big attraction to going to that, that April show. humidity in that room. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You know, that that kind of spurred things and i just i kept working on project and kept trying to get better and better you know i was a big fan of missing links at the time uh which was run by andrew dextrous and i reached out to him and i said hey how do i put a model on your website how do i do this you know and he said well take some pictures and i would take pictures and send them to him he's like no nah, these are not not good enough here's why try this and i did that for probably six or eight months and then i had a model that he was like yeah those are great great photos and he posted it. And that was kind of another point where things took off. And then, oh, geez, probably in 2010, 2011, Marcus Nichols ran an ad into me, a model magazine and said, hey, we're looking for contributors. I responded. I sent him some photos of, of some builds and he said, these look great. What do you want to build? So I think the first published model that I did for him was the Great Wall Hobbies 12.8 centimeter pack 44, the big gun on the... Um, uh, the four wheel carriage and that, yeah, that's, that just kind of kicked things off with the, with a relationship with Marcus and been kind of doing that ever since. So, yeah, that's, that's kind of how I, I first got to know your work, um, was really, you know, some of the, the builds you've had on to me, a magazine talk about some of those in a bit, but I want to go back a little bit and just ask you a question. So your, your big brother was kind of, it sounds like your first influence into the hobby. And it's yes. interesting. It's interesting that he was kind of more pointed at that remote control end of the hobby, but you were kind of more at the scale modeling end of the hobby. And I noticed that your, your daughter seems to be artistically inclined too. So was, yes. <laughs> was, was the art of scale modeling? Is that what kind of drew you to it or, or, or what was it? I'm curious. I, yeah, I think so. Just the artistic aspect of it in artistic expression. I, you know, and, and I like, I've always liked building things and putting things together. I, I probably built more, I, you know, I did the radio control airplane thing for a while, for a while. I probably built, well, I know I built more airplanes than I actually flew because I seemed to enjoy that more than than actually flying the airplanes because I didn't I wasn't very good at that crashed a bunch of them, a bunch of them but yeah the artistic aspect of it has always appealed to me and the best part of the hobby for me is just looking at other people's work and their artistic expressions and that's what's so great about the hobbies you can go in a million different directions um, you can make it as sterile and as clean and as technical as you want it, or you can make it as artistic and visually appealing and eye catching as you want to. And then there's kind of, you know, something in there for everybody. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. And another thing that's interesting is, you know, we, we seem to have a lot of friends that fly airliners <laughs> for a living. <laughs> you know, we've got Steve Baker and John Everett and yourself and Dan Nofel. You know, we Derek have a lot Post. of yeah, Derek Post. Derek just, Post. Yeah. Yeah. Got a lot of friends that fly airplanes. I mean, is there some kind of uh of a connection there that we don't know about? Or I think some of it is probably a pilot's personality. We always joke about how we're all kind of the same in terms of being for lack of a better way of saying it. We're all kind of a little anal retentive, a little detail oriented, a little uh, obsessive with 
with doing things well, you know, that, that as a, a pilot, you're always kind of striving to do the perfect flight where there's no errors that are made and that, you know, everything's, everything goes exactly the way it's supposed to, and you end up with a smooth landing. And so there's, that kind of applies to, I think, to scale modeling too. You're always after the perfect project, the perfect model, you know, and it's good and it's bad. It can lead you down the rabbit hole of being obsessed with details, which everybody does uh, <laughs> at some point, but it, it makes it, makes it interesting. And then I think a lot of it's just love of aviation. You know, interestingly, I, I didn't really build airplanes until about, oh geez, I don't know, seven or eight years ago. I, I started out as an armor modeler and built almost exclusively armor projects. And then it, people would start asking me, well, you're a pilot. Why don't you build airplanes? And I'm like, eh, not my thing, you know? And they would look at me funny with this. You know, well, what do you mean? It's not your thing. <laughs> you're, All the cool people build armor. So <laughs> Yeah. And I know it's been talked about on on the podcast quite a bit. There is still kind of a, a definitive, you know, there's a difference between armor modelers and and, and aircraft modelers and, and their their ability to share information techniques, you know, whatever the case is. I think it's getting better. I think some of those lines are 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 being crossed and some people are are kind of opening up and they're willing to share. But yeah, I just remember going to some shows where it's like, oh, don't don't talk to those guys. They're the aircraft modelers, and it's like, well, yeah, they're not going to talk to you anyway because because <laughs> they're the aircraft modelers. But I think that's changed. I think for the better, you know, in the last few years. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we like Steve Baker. We let him hang around. So and he, he's an yeah, he's guy. he's all right. He's yeah. I. Right. He's I. Right. <laughs> Jeremy, I want to I want to hit on a point. You mentioned perfection, and and I'll I'll use uh, I'll use a comparison for perfection in your photographs. I think your photos our perfection. You know, when I look at Thank when you. I look yeah. when I look at your Facebook, everything you post on your scale modeling page is crisp. I mean, literally the best. So, I'd love to have you kind of just walk through and maybe share with our listeners, how do you go about achieving such great photos? Maybe what's your setup? What kind of camera? Is there any post processing? Cuz I would love yeah. to know to be honest. Yeah, that's interesting you brought that up JB because it's the photography has has been one of those things that kind of went with the uh with getting involved in in publishing articles writing articles and doing the photography thing i'm i have to admit i'm self-taught i really don't know much about photography i don't know much about depth of field and iso settings and, and any of that kind of stuff what i did was in teaching myself was basically asking as many questions to as many people who knew you know a lot about the subject and i did that through online forums kind of learned prior to the you know the advent of youtube and that kind of thing so it was it was a little bit harder but you know i i just kind of taught myself how to do it i took i have to admit i took one class through a local um photography store on macro photography which that helped a lot in understanding, you know, the best equipment and then how to get the best results. The setup I use is pretty simple. It's it's an icon. It's an older generation of digital uh, the D5300. I shoot in aperture mode. I use a remote for uh, for taking each photo, uh, you know, on a tripod. And then I just have some kind of, they're not real expensive, just white, I guess they're white fluorescent lights on a uh I have some graduated backdrops. One of them is blue, one of them is gray. You know, they go from solid blue to, to uh, they fade to a white. Uh, the same thing with the gray. One of the biggest things I found and one of the hardest things for me to figure out was white balance in photography. And that's something that that's not discussed a whole lot. I think white balance kind of sets the tone of, as far as what, what your camera recognizes as white. Uh, and then it kind of bases all the colors off of that. So if you're using lighting, that's not normal lighting that the camera is used to, and you don't set the white balance, you're going to have a yellow tint, a greenish tint, some kind of hue to it that doesn't look right. I do very little post-processing in it. And that was one of the other struggles is the better the photography are, the less post-processing you have to do. Um, so initially I did a ton of post-processing because I took photos that just looked awful. And I was, you know, manually adjusting the white balance within Photoshop. And I'm like, this is way too hard. It's taking way too long. I take a picture and then I just got to spend, you know, another five to seven minutes on each picture. So that's when I learned about white balance, making sure that, that that was set for the lighting that I was using. Try to be consistent. I turn, you know, when I'm in my workshop and I'm taking photos, I turn every light on because that's how I set up the white balance for the camera. And then I, you know, I'll, I'll take, you know, when I do a typical magazine article, I'll submit probably 60 photos 
but all I've taken probably 150 uh, of the model, different, you know, diff- from different angles, uh, using the tripod, you know, using the different backdrops, and then I'll do some post processing with with Photoshop. And usually, it, I'm just do- using the the automatic sharpening feature that kind of tightens things up a little bit and makes the, the photos a little sharper and a little more crisp. But it's nothing complicated. Like I said, I don't know a whole lot about it, so I'm just kind of using the features that are in the software to the best that I can. The remote itself allows you to do it hands-free. So it's on the tripod. I use the remote and then that ensures, because when you're in aperture mode, that depending on the lighting and the exposure, it, it'll the lens may stay open a little bit longer than it would during a normal shot, you know, using auto. So uh, the remote helps quite a bit because you push it and you're not touching anything because it's, there've been times I'm trying to hold a, a piece of the model while I'm uh, taking a picture of it and it's, <laughs> It always ends up blurry because you just can't hold my breath and count to 10 and think I'm not moving. And then, you know, it's it's pretty blurry after I take the photo. Yeah, I, I will say, though, you know, Jeremy, an interesting thing you bring up is the sharpness in post-processing. I remember Adam Wilder talked about it on our pod, oh my gosh, a year ago. And then I started looking into it and researching it just like you. And just that little bit, just, I don't yes. know what it does, but man, it it like, it levels up the photography, especially macro shots. It, it yes. really just... It makes them just snap. And some of the pictures I see on your site, like the cockpit photos and some of the, you know, really tight detail shots of engines, like you can tell, like they are just super crisp. And I, and I think probably that sharpness adjustment really helps in that regard. Yeah, I, I, I think you're right. And like I said, I don't really know what it does. It's the magic button for me. I press it and (laughs) and everything looks a lot better. And I'm like, that's awesome. That's cool. That's a good one. Next, you know, (laughs) But it starts to, or it helps to start with a just the basics of you know a good shot in focus with good lighting. I found when I use a macro lens, I don't need. Sometimes I'll I'll adjust the brightness uh, in some of the other photos, especially when you're photographing against a, a white background. You know, I want to brighten the white up a little bit, so I'll I'll adjust the brightness. But otherwise. You know, with a macro lens, I don't need to do that. And I think it has to do with how much light the lens allows in when it takes the photo. But that could just, you know, I could just be talking out of my. Yeah. (laughs) So I want to go back to one of the things you said at the beginning. It sounds like we're right around the same age, actually. I'm a huge military modeler magazine fan myself. Oh, yeah. I grew up on that magazine. I remember running to the Thriftway in Washington State at the beginning of every month. Yeah. And I would grab that thing and just hold it like it was like, I, I don't know what. I, I want to talk about one of your kids specifically, because I, I was going through your stuff. I was doing a little cyber stalking. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I, I stole that from Scott. So Scott does that very well. So you did a uh, FM2 Wildcat in the late war blue. Yes. On your website. That yep. is probably the color on that is I, I, I'm out here in Southern California, so I do. There's some really good aircraft modelers out here, of course, but I've never seen one that that blue where it's it's like nailed it. And you know, I'd like you to talk about how you got that color and the weathering on it because dark colors are hugely hard to get weathering to show. Yes, it. and you nailed it. And I just would thank you. Possibly Thanks. walk us through a little bit of that. Yeah, um, that's the uh, the Arma kit uh, in 172nd, and you know, Scott sometimes mentions, "Oh, I'm a I'm a great 172nd scale modeler." Model that's probably like the fourth or the fifth 172nd scale model I've built in the last 15 years. So I, I don't, it's not my normal scale. Yeah. It just, it just always ends up on the magazines and the covers of magazines, <laughs> but, but you know, he's only done three or four. Yeah. And, and I, and I thought it was 148 or 132nd. So don't worry about it. <laughs> oh, I, I appreciate that. Yeah. It's the Arma kit. Fantastic kit. Uh, went together very well. It's basically, uh, it's Mr. Color glossy sea blue out of the bottle. It's, you know, it's a gloss paint. And I, I did some experimenting because the difficulty in painting gloss in that small a scale is, is if it comes out glossy, it looks like a toy or it's, it's too glossy. It's too shiny. It doesn't have the scale aspect to it. You know, and then that leads down the rabbit hole of what's, what's, what do you mean by scale and color? And I think everybody kind of has a gist of some things just don't look right when they're painted on a small subject. Uh, If you took the glossy sea blue that they painted a real wildcat with and sprayed it on a model, it wouldn't, you know, probably wouldn't look right. But I experimented with that because I I didn't want a glossy finish, but I love the color. So I actually thinned it with Mr. Rapid Thinner, which technically is not 
formulated according to to guns either is not formulated for gloss paints more for metallics but when i airbrushed it 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 dried in a semi-gloss finish more or less and it looked perfect so it was not something that i did by design it was one of those happy accidents that i you know i tried it with mr color to or uh, with mr rapid thinner too glossy or i'm sorry mr leveling i've got too many misters <laughs> It's hard to keep the Mr. straight. I tried it with Mr. Leveling Thinner and it was too glossy. But the Mr. Rapid Thinner, just in terms of how that stuff dries, you know, it it dries more quickly and it came out to the the perfect, you know, semi-gloss finish. And then the weathering, I just, it's it's an enamel panel line wash, one of the MIG products that, you know, you don't want to go black because you can't see black over dark blue. You don't want to go white because then it's too dark or it's too too much of a contrast, the white on the dark. So it's it's kind of a, I think it's Kriegsmarine gray was the color uh, that I used. And then I just did some chipping with Prismacolor silver pencil. That's probably my favorite tool for, for chipping on aircraft, keeping it sharp, you know, keeping the point sharp. I don't even think I put a, uh, a matte coat on that. It was just kind of left as is just the way it came out. That's one of the problems that I, I find myself in is I, you get to the point where you're, you're close to finishing something. You're like one more step. No, I don't want to do that. Cause I don't know what the outcome is going to be. Is it going to ruin it? Is it going to, you know, and, and it's hard to say, okay, this is where I'm leaving it. This is how it's it's going to, it's going to yes. stay. That step away or in that last step is it, it, to know you're at that step and then do step away is hard, but you know, it is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Jeremy, quick question. You know, you mentioned using the prism color silver pencil. I, I'd be curious your technique around it. You know, are, are you bouncing it off the surface or, you, you know, you chug a cup of coffee and then you go at each panel line. <laughs> you know, I'd, I'd love to understand how, how you achieve that kind of, you know, randomness yeah. And, and yeah, that effect. It's it, it takes some practice. And what I found with with using the, the Prismacolor pencil is and I always use this philosophy with weathering is less is more. So I always start small and I'll I'll just basically touch the tip of the pencil to the model and do that over and over and over and over and over. Um, and I'll do it around panel lines in the intersection of panel lines, areas where there's going to be wear. And if if I'm trying to, to, you know, to replicate an area where there's more exposed metal, I'll just keep doing that in that area over and over and over. So it's a series of just taps, real small taps with the idea of if... If I start moving the the pencil tip back and forth side to side, then you you've got less control. You're making bigger strokes. They're easier or they're more difficult to to fix than if you you make smaller marks and and build up the effect to where you like it. But yeah. the, the key, like I said, is just keeping the tip. You know, if I do a a wing root, for example, I I'm probably sharpening the pencil five or six times while I'm doing a wing root just to keep okay. the tip as sharp as possible. That's really good to know. You know, sticking on the pencil theme real quick. When I think you bring up a good point, when it's gloss versus semi versus matte, do you find? I'll be honest, I struggle sometimes with a glossy finish for that pencil. I, I you can call it lead, you can call it pigment, whatever. You know, the pencil tip struggles to grip, but I I think what you're saying is that Prisma pencil really, it doesn't seem to matter what surface, it still grips pretty well. Yes. Yeah. I've tried other brands. I've tried, you know, the cheap, some of the cheaper craft, uh, you know, Michaels or AC Moore brand pencils. They just don't, I I don't know what it is with Prisma color. It's, It's a little bit higher quality. I have not used any of the AK pencils, um, any of those colored pencils. I, I just, I've, I'd like to try them, but I haven't had a chance to incorporate those yet. Yeah. And I bring that up because I'm, I'm holding, this sits at my desk all the time. I have a Prismacolor Silver. I have the AK set. And, and that's why I bring up the question between gloss, matte, and semi, because the AK pencils, I think they're great in some cases, but they really struggle to achieve that effect you're getting on a glossy surface. Matte, they grip really, really well. Right. But but I think on a glossy, they just struggle to deposit any type of color yeah. on the surface. And that's that's an interesting point, JB, because one of the things I do when I paint is I guess traditionally aircraft modelers and again, it's there's a rabbit hole that opens when you, you talk about this, the whole idea of glossing before decals and <laughs> You know that can that can start World War Three on, on an online forum. If you I gloss, so it's okay. <laughs> yeah, don't yeah. go there. Don't don't go there, please. <laughs> yeah, I adapted this 
this process of, you know, we, we paint in matte paints most of the time. And then, you know, you kind of have to go through the exercise of, okay, if I'm going to put decals down, I'm, I'm going to put some kind of gloss coat, but I'm also putting a, a gloss coat or a semi-gloss coat because it makes the, the weathering process easier for me, especially for panel line washes. Panel line washes over a matte surface don't end up being panel line washes. It ends up being more of a, almost like a filter, you know, cause it's, it's a porous surface and more of the, more of it gets absorbed. So I started, you know, whatever color I'm painting in, I'll add to me a clear gloss to it. So that if it's a flat paint, I'm turning it into a semi-gloss paint and I'm kind of skipping the, or not skipping, but I'm, I'm eliminating the additional step of having to put a gloss coat over it uh, or a semi-gloss coat over it. Uh, it seems counterintuitive. Some guys in our local club have always asked me, it's like, well, why do you do that? Why don't you just spray gloss over it? And I'm like, well, why are you just, why are you, why are you painting in matte paints to begin with? If you're going to put a gloss coat over it, you know, which came first, the chicken or the egg, you know, you can get into that kind of discussion. You, you, this is really interesting, Jeremy. I'm glad you brought up this point. I truly believe the best way to spray Tamiya XF series is putting a few drops of gloss in it. I think it makes a yeah. massive difference. It makes, yeah. And it makes a difference with, with Mr. Color Paint paints, which are similar, you know, it's a similar chemistry, mm-hmm. I guess, with Tamiya, more of a lacquer than an acrylic, but it, it, I, I find the same thing with, with Tamiya flat paints. I rarely, if ever anymore, paint Tamiya flat paints as flat. I think I always add uh, gloss to it, just uh, along with Mr. Leveling Thinner, and you get a nice semi-gloss surface. And that, for me, for the weathering process that I use for airplanes, that's that's huge because now the panel line goes on and the panel line comes off really easily, uh, and it's left where it's supposed to be, and it doesn't, doesn't accumulate in areas where it shouldn't. Yeah, shooting in a semi-gloss. I agree with uh, you with you and John. First of all, it straddles the line between how much gloss are you going to need or not need for decals, but yet it performs better in the brush anyway, you know, having yeah. that having that eggshell finish rather than a true flat. The flat paints to me, especially to me, because uh, those are really flat. They they tend to dust in corners, you know, yes. wing, wing yep. roots and stuff. Wing and, roots where, yeah, you're, mm-hmm. you're getting into a, a curved surface and a 90 degree angle and it has the opportunity to kind of almost form a vortex and then it sticks to areas and, and dries more quickly. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 then the other thing is on the three or four seventy second scale aircraft that you've done, when you're working that small, I think a lot of people forget that if you start putting too many gloss and matte coats down, you start sort of losing the scale of the actual finish. You can actually kind of start to see more of a surface there than I think you yes. really want to. Yeah, no, that's that's very true, Scott. Yeah, you can you can definitely gloss your way out of a realistic finish pretty, pretty quickly. And like I said, in that small scale. Yeah. The, the, the aircraft that actually made me think of that is, is what I wanted to talk to you about anyway. And that's the first build that, that I think you and I talked about. Um, and that was your 109 G 14, I think, um, that was on the cover of the Tamiya model mag modeling magazine. Oh yeah. The 109 G six, the Tamiya uh, 170 second yeah. scale. Yep. Yeah. Just, just gorgeous. And, uh, thank you. The, the finish, on it just is is really really stunning and and I think you know there's some guys out there and, and you're one of a handful of them that in that 170 second scale aircraft you just you make finishes that really are scale you know the diffusion that you get the you know the layers that you're putting on it are so so thin that you know you, your subjects you you look at a photograph and and you struggle you know to figure out is this 48 is this 70 second <laughs> scale because you really do a great job there thank you thanks I appreciate that. It's yeah, one seventy second is is fun because it's it's a challenge. It's it's smaller size and painting small is a uh, is kind of a a technique that has to be developed too. And that's something that I learned on that that uh, subject. The f- the first one seventy second scale airplane that I built, you know, I, I had be- built some probably fifteen years ago, and then I built an Arma Hurricane and they're one of their Hurricane Mark One kits, which again, really nice kit, and I learned a lot in terms of painting when I built that kit. And then I picked up the, the, uh, to me, a 172nd scale BF 109. And that was a lot of fun. I, I did some, um, some painted on markings as well, uh, on that, which that was another challenge, but it was something I thought was worthwhile, uh, trying and experimenting with I, I've become a huge proponent in airbrushing markings 
whenever I can and not using decals just because I, I you get a, uh, a more, more realistic finish, especially, you know, like take stars and bars on a, you know, a P47 or P51. If you can do those well on a wing surface that has rivets and panels that, you know, a decal would have difficulty adhering to and conforming to, there's a little more preparation, a little more work involved, but I think you get a better result. So that JB mentioned turning point that for me in modeling airplanes, painted on markings became a huge turning point for me. And it, and it's something that I picked up and I, I, like I said, I try to use as much as I can. I cut my own masks a lot of times, but I'm also not afraid to cheat. And if somebody else has got some, Hey man, I'm, I'm using them. I'm, I'm all over them. I'll take, <laughs> if someone else has done the hard work, I'll, I'll use the masks, you know, use those to paint markings. So I assume you have a silhouette cutter. I do. Yes. I bought a used one off eBay because I wasn't sure how the whole thing was going to work. I spent 50 bucks on it and my, uh, my CAD cam background came into play uh, when setting all that up. Cause I'm like, Oh yeah, X, Y, I can do X, Y. This is easy. I can draw in the basic drawing program that, uh, that comes with those, those silhouette cutters. So I, I'm like, this is pretty easy. This is pretty cool. So I upgraded and bought a Cameo 4, uh, which has a wider bed. And I love it. It's it's changed things quite a bit for me. And I, I mentioned the CAD CAM thing initially. I just, just a couple of days ago, I just signed up for a class through uh, local community college uh, that's an introduction to AutoCAD. And I'm going to go back and kind of resharpen the tools, <laughs> so to speak, because it's something that I think I can use. The, the software that's with those uh, those silhouette cutters are is pretty basic and it's it's hard. I found it difficult to make small drawings with the fidelity that you could with something like AutoCAD. So uh, I'm going to try that and then I'm going to just go to town, hopefully. <laughs> I think the last version of AutoCAD that I used when I was in college was AutoCAD 10. So that would have been like 1995. So I'm curious to see how it's evolved. And yeah. So I got a question for you concerning your website. I, I, I've, I've looked through it for a couple of days now and I see one picture of the box of the F-35A. Uh -huh, yes. <laughs> are you are you doing it? Or Yes. You, okay. I have to. That, that kit just, it's just unbelievably engineered mm -hmm. and it's Tamiya and... Um, you know, I, I listen to the Model Geeks, uh, their podcast as well. And those guys kind of have a theme of, you know, life's too short to build shitty kits. And yeah. I'm kind of getting to that point in my my age and my my dexterity and my willingness to fight a model. So it, it's that's an easy choice uh, for me. I'm not in love with the airplane itself. I think it's kind of an ugly airplane, but but it's an F-35 and it's it's cool. I have some connections to the to the airplane itself indirectly. I guess my wife's from Burlington, Vermont, and there's a uh, uh, guard squadron up there that has the F-35 now, the Green Mountain Boys. Long story short, my brother-in-law, my wife's brother, is on the city council, city of Burlington, was kind of instrumental in getting the F-35s. They had F-16s, the squadron. At one point, they were talking about transitioning to drones, no more jets there, and they ended up uh, securing that and, and keeping jets and, and getting the F-35. So I kind of have an interest in doing one of the uh, the Vermont Guard Squadron markings. There's some cool aggressor squadron or uh, yeah, aggressor squadron markings that are out now as well. That I think the Air Force just reactivated a, an aggressor squadron out at Nellis, and they're going to use those. So I may do one of those. We'll have to see. Yeah, I've got a buddy that flies out there to Nellis is on the aggressor squadron. There, there's some interesting. Inter he sent me some pictures and some yeah. pretty interesting stuff out there. I have this habit of of I don't I don't pick easy when it comes to. To doing uh, an airplane in terms of markings, or you know, when it when a kit comes out, I don't look at what's in the box. It, it, it's just my thing. I don't know what it is, but I, I have to find something different. It, perfect example that uh, I've been working on the to me a P thirty eight, and I wanted to do one in D day invasion stripes, which you know, I it's just something that I thought looked cool on that airplane and I committed to doing it. I started and I, I've successfully painted those stripes now and I'm, I'm almost done with the, the kit and the airplane. I'm like, why did I choose that scheme? Because those stripes were a huge pain in the ass to paint and to to get to look realistic. And I never realized how many compound curves there are on the booms, the tail booms of that thing. It's just, yeah. I was going to say that's the around those uh, little intakes and the yes. exhausts and oh my gosh. And then, then it it's tapering and yep. it, geez, oh man. I mean, a lot of Tamiya tape, I assume to accomplish yes. those. 
And unfortunately, I did not. When it was all done, I had a huge pile of tape on my workbench that I had (laughs) peeled off. And I didn't take a picture of it. And I wish I had because it was just people would look at that and be like, you're nuts. That's that's way too much tape and way too much money spent. But hey, hey, it looks damn good. All in the cause of building a model, <laughs> whatever it, it takes. Exactly. So, you know, sticking on the theme of the P38, I think it's really interesting. You know, Steve Baker showed me when you first started doing it. I, you know, when I look around the Internet, there's not many people appreciating natural metal finishes. And I really love the patina look you got from you using the templates for those random, you know, blob patterns, essentially. Yes. Yeah. Having that underneath was like, oh, damn, that's genius. Like (laughs) just clicks in that regard. I I think it looks awesome. What what made you do that? So, I, you know, I've done natural metal finish on a number of of, uh, airplanes in the last four or five years. And I kind of figured out how to do it and how to, to make it look realistic. And, and I was happy with it, but there was always something that to me was missing in terms of, you know, you look at an airplane from that era and there's, you know, depending on where the airplane served, you kind of see an oxidized look sometimes, um, you know, that they're not as reflective as, uh, we would like to think they are, if you took something and sprayed it out of the bottle, it would probably be too reflective. And actually Matt McDougall from Duke's Model Works has been, he had done some experience uh, experiments along the same lines. And I watched a couple of his videos and I'm like, you know what, I need to try that because that, that looks like it would work. Yeah, that, I just kind of took his, some of his ideas and expanded on those. And then I ended up, uh, I painted a, a base coat of Tamiya LP11, uh, their new lacquer paint line, their aluminum finish paint. And then I went over that with uh, a pre-cut mask that has those, for lack of a a better term, the modeling uh, cutouts, you know, it's like a model pattern. Um, And I think I used Mr. Color Dark Engine Gray. And it was tough because you you have this, I had this finish that looked awesome. You know, I'm like, because to me, lacquer paints, they're, they're, you know, they're fantastic, especially the metallics. They look really, really nice. They spray well. I airbrushed everything and I'm like, damn, I should just leave it where it is. But part of it was pushing and saying, no, this is what you've done with the last five airplanes with natural metal finish. Let's, you know, keep going, keep pushing. So I, I did the, uh, the modeling work and then I went back over and just did very, very light coats of the LP 11 again, allowing some of that to, to show through. It's difficult to photograph. That's the, the problem with showing the results. You know, I, I did a short video kind of twisting and turning the panel of the wing panel so you could see how the light catches it. And it, it looks pretty good. Yeah, it, it definitely was what I was after. It was the look that I was trying to achieve. And it came out better than expected. And it was a lot less work than I expected. It, it was some of it was just the fear of doing something new and trying something, but I'm glad I did it. And it's it's definitely a process I'm going to use again. Of course. On the wings, I then painted all the all that over with invasion stripes. <laughs> you can't see most of it, but yes, but. you did. <laughs> <laughs> Some people might say you're kind of your own worst enemy there. But. Oh, absolutely, I, and I say that all the time. I'm my own, my own worst enemy because it, it it in a number of different ways things that yeah things that we do and the things that we <laughs> we talk ourselves into doing. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I can see Grant squirming because he he loves model airplanes so much. So let's uh. Let's go back and uh, have a couple of questions about armor. So first question is kind of walk us through um, your entry into the Sherman group build. Love that Sherman. And then uh, second of all, one of one of the uh, early, early builds that you and I also kind of connected on a little bit was you started at least one sixteenth scale uh, Stewart. So let, yes. let's, let's talk about your Sherman first and then let's find out where that uh, Stewart's been hiding. Yeah. Um, the Sherman, I, I, built probably a dozen Shermans. That's my favorite armor subject. Um, that's what I, back in the, uh, in the late nineties, early two thousands, that's pretty much all I built were Shermans. So when, when that subject came up for the group field, I'm like, oh yeah, I got to do this. I got to build one years ago, probably, I don't know, 2004, 2005, I did some research for Woody Vondersek of Archer Fine Transfers. Uh, we came up with a set, well, there were like three or four sets of free French markings for Sherman's and then one for a Stewart. So I've always loved the, the free French markings, uh, the second armor division, free French that were, you know, they were based in England. They came, they landed in France, I think in August 
you know, well after D-Day. But I've always loved the markings on those because they're colorful. You know, they have provincial names on the sides uh, in yellow. And then, you know, you've got the uh, the French flag, turret numbers, just lots of markings, lots of color, which um, it helps with the Sherman because it's, you know, it's all of drab. So it, it adds some color to it. So it, I converted one of the Asuka kits, the M4A2. They don't make one with the welded driver's hoods, which was typical of, of the M4A2s from the from that that second armor division. So I used a resin upper hull from TMD. That was that's kind of the basic conversion. It's just the upper hull replacement, and then the rest of the Asuka parts fit in terms of the engine deck and the final drive housing, differential cover, and the turret and all that stuff. And I had a lot of fun because I had not built a Sherman in a long time or hadn't finished one in a long time. And the group build really motivated me to get that done. And then ultimately, that was why I had to go to nationals. Um, heck yeah, heck yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, and w- one thing I one thing I wanted you to talk about what blew me away, you know, as we got to go through all these Shermans and look at each one, you know, this topic of Shermans don't chip or whatever. Your your chipping and the amount of really really light chipping on that, I think it's one of the best Sherman models that I've seen as far as the restrained, really you. really realistic looking chipping. Um, how, you know, what was your kind of approach there and and how did you do that yeah that's that's a uh, i appreciate those comments scott i have always been a, a firm believer and, and i think i mentioned this before less is more and i always try to, to attain this look of subtlety when it comes to weathering not that i don't like i, I don't know if there's ever if there's even a, a term over weathered people use that term I don't, I don't necessarily agree it works for for some models it doesn't work for others but my I guess style more or less has always been subtlety and and that concept of less is more. So I don't actually call it chipping. I call it edging because what I typically do is and the use I've used the same process on other Sherman models. I like to use uh, enamels for that process, and I use Tamiya enamels. It's a mix of black and red brown. The small Tamiya bottles, which are a pain. In the- to get in the U.S., the stuff that I have, I've all ordered via eBay. That's the only way you can get it, I think, for whatever reason, you, they can't import it. So to me, enamel is a mix of, of black and red brown. And then basically what I do is just go along the edges or the angles where surfaces meet and do that that process. I don't I don't touch the whole surface. You know, if, if you look at like the angle of where the upper hull or the sides of the upper hull meets the, the top of the upper hull, I won't cover that entire surface. I'll skip some spots, but, and then I'll do the same thing on the applique armor plates. And then, you know, the, uh, maybe the tops of the uh, grab handles, that kind of thing. And it's, it's just a, a highlight or a way of defining an edge and it just adds some contrast it's it, you know much darker obviously than the olive drab so you kind of it gathers your or gains your attention but it doesn't jump out at you in terms of you know being too stark or too much contrast yeah. you know like i said just trying to be subtle yeah i was wondering about that it's an edge highlight i do the same thing on figures but a lighter color of course to highlight right the edge. but right you know, yeah and, same concept yeah yeah same concept yep. different different shade uh yeah i'd really love the sherman's fat it look fantastic and it looked really good at the show but i the one thing I loved about the Sherman was that big box on the back of the, the back of the vehicle. Yes. Was that yeah. a standard French yes. armor, that armored division standard? Or, okay. Second armor, second armor division. So they were, I guess, fitted in the UK and they, all of their tanks had that, that rear storage stowage box. Mm-hmm. You know, there's, there's a handful of photos on the internet. And I, I always had, a, I had built one years ago that I used those Archer fine transfer markings on and I scratch built the box. I had the dimensions and they're more or less eyeballed because there's no technical drawing available anywhere for that. But I always had a hard time with the, the fasteners on the rear of the box. So I kind of, I don't know, just kind of took a swag at it and made some fasteners and posted some photos. And then lo and behold, um, one of the guys on the um, uh, modeling the Sherman tank Facebook page posted a photo and was like, here you go. Here's a photo of, of the box and the fasteners and what they look like. And I was like, where'd you get that? <laughs> Why have I not seen this before? You know, so that helped a lot in terms of being able to, to, to get those details on that box and make it look more, more like, you know, what, what the original did. 
Yeah, and it's another unique kind of feature to those Shermans, makes them look a little different. I was going to say, I think, you know, on the U.S. side, I'll, the only thing I've seen like that on the U.S. Shermans were the 105s, where they would carry extra stowage in the back or extra yes. rounds in the back. Yeah. But yeah, it, it, you know, it's a small detail. It's not small. It's a big box. But it, it, it's one of those details that, in my opinion, reached out and grabbed the viewer because it was something that broke up the shape. And yes. And with a Sherman, you've got that, everybody knows that 75 millimeter of the whole shape. And But you you throw something on there like that it's like to me it's like one of the pacific shermans where they put the, the wood on the side and they you know the nails through the on the roofs so the japanese couldn't crawl on top but you know it was yeah. just yeah, I love one that. of those yeah unique features yeah yeah i, I have to admit <laughs> i actually i spent way too much money on a 3d printed version of that box that someone had designed that i purchased on um oh shoot i can't even think shapeways of shapeways so i i did a google search you know i was pressed for time i'm like if i can find one and somebody's done the work i'll buy it and then i bought it and it showed up and i'm like no this is not even close <laughs> it made me mad but it's one of those things that I'm like, okay, you know, that you get, I didn't use do it my as a due, pattern. Yeah. Didn't do my due diligence and uh, spent too much money on it. Shame on me. <laughs> there's, there's where that uh, CAD cam class will come in handy. Exactly. Next time. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so Jeremy, before we jump back to the Stewart, potentially, I, I do want to say your friend, she's great, but it ain't my favorite Sherman from you. And I think the first time <laughs> I re really recognized your work and I was really inspired I, and I, to this day, it's one of my favorite Shermans ever in scale. It's your M4A1. It, it was on yes. the cover, I believe, of Military Modeler uh, Illustrated. Um, yes. Yep. Yeah. And I was like, damn, this is who built this? And uh, <laughs> found out it's you going lo and behold. And then I creep on your site. I'm like, oh, he's an aircraft guy too. But I'm, I'm happy to hear that you were an armor guy first. So, but, but that said, I just really love this build. And I think for me, the thing I love the most is your approach to olive drab. The olive drab on this is really different than your, like either people get it so dark, it just, it looks right. It has that really earthy tone. It, can you walk us through maybe how you accomplished that, you know, that, that finish on olive drab for that one? Yeah. I, olive drab is one of those colors that I love to paint and that I love, I hate to paint. It's, it's mm -hmm. because it's, you know, if you paint olive drab and you don't do anything to it, it's, it's featureless and it's flat and it's dull and it's boring and it's just it's you know it's not real pleasant to look at but I, you know some of it went back to my days on missing links observing you know what some of those the, some of the the well-known modelers of the time like uh adam wilder uh marin van gills mike rinaldi i mean he was mike was very active in missing links back then so i kind of adapted this process of olive drab in, in terms of painting my favorite olive drab color is to me xf62 they're olive drab it's too dark out of the bottle for me it, it doesn't look right steve zaloga i think was one of the first to say hey you know if you lighten this with uh dark yellow you get a nice nicer olive drab hue so that's that's the process that i use is i use the xf62 lightened with their what is it xf58 dark yellow and then just do that in successive layers so a dark layer a lighter layer and then an even lighter layer and then i go back with a, a pin wash a detail wash uh, and then the edging process that build i used all pigments basically i was a uh, a big fan of, of mike rinaldi's use of pigments you know so i picked his brain i emailed mike was always very good I, I sent him probably a dozen emails about using pigments back before you know he had even published any of his books he was always very gracious responded you know usually right away offered great advice great tips and then same thing when i did the winter whitewash finish on another sherman that i did uh he he helped me through that that sherman that the one you're talking about JF, jb the m4a1 probably my favorite one for me that was kind of a a level up project the stowage stowage has always been a big thing for me as well on sherman's doing it well making it look realistic not slapping stuff to the sides of the turret or on the hull and seeing space underneath you know that kind of thing so i i used a lot of um epoxy putty tarps and bed rolls and integrated you know for linden stowage and blast model stowage and legend production stowage into that build kind of to bring all that stuff together to make it look realistic that's that's yeah the uh, solid solid dish road wheels in your figure on that build were pretty stunning as well thank you thanks yeah figure painting is is that's one of those things i love too but i don't 
do it enough. And I feel like I have to learn it all over again. When I, you know, I painted that figure this summer, this past summer for that, uh, for the group build project, I sat down and I'm like, oh boy, here we go. This is going to be a, uh, a challenge, but I adapted some new techniques that I've learned from some of you guys like TJ and it, it went pretty quickly and, you know, I was up against the deadline of getting it done. And I, in the end, I was, was pretty happy with it. So, yeah. So just for future reference, Jeremy, if there's something that you only do two or three of, or not very much, you need to do more of that, <laughs> you know, like 70 second scale aircraft figures. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, let, let's talk about my missing Stuart, that one sixteenth scale kit. The lost Stuart. Yeah. Yeah. So I, in addition to the Sherman, I've always loved the Stuart. I built uh, three or four one thirty fifth scale Stuarts. When that classy hobby one sixteenth kit came out, I was all over that it was one of those those deals where the box showed up and i ripped it open and i started right away and i'd say it's probably 60 percent done the uh the suspension's done the lower hull the tracks the tracks were pretty time consuming but pretty easy to put together just you know clean up and that was probably the biggest time consuming thing and in, in doing the tracks real nice kit lots of uh you know room for for added details i've I've added uh, weld marks with some Tamiya two-party epoxy putty. I've done some casting marks with some of the Archer products. Added some Aber barrels to the coax machine gun and the whole mounted machine gun. I never started the turret. I stopped. I was I was hoping that an interior would be released for that kit, and it's never never seen the light of day. So. That's that was my excuse for stopping. I can't use that excuse anymore. I just need to. And then after watching Spud Murphy, John Murphy, and his build of that that uh, kit, yeah. it's just phenomenal, and fantastic. Yeah. yeah, he his he is the master of texture, especially on on large scale builds like that. You know, I love what he does with with textures and and painting, and it's just unbelievable how he you know, like. I look at the shovel on the front fender of his and it's just you know you, you want to unstrap it and take it out and <laughs> dig a hole with it you know <laughs> yeah he, he really i mean i think i think he probably got a little bit of that from adam you know that using each individual component yes treating it like its own story you know each yes. bolt each pioneer tool yeah. each weld is a, is a separate little story yeah and uh yeah he, he's really really good at that well hopefully uh you get that one finished at some point uh, be excited to see what you do with it yeah same here i i picked up that andy's hobby headquarters uh that 116 scale sherman and i kind of told myself i can't start that until i till i finish that Stuart. so that'll hopefully <laughs> well, motivate me <laughs> and you cashed in your retirement because you uh you actually use those aber casting marks in 116 scale which are rarer than hen's teeth <laughs> yeah very true those are those are uh i bought a bunch of those when they went out of business uh when archer went out of business and and yeah, those are those are great. When you look at where this hobby has come in the last even 10, 15 years, it's unbelievable. Um, I think back to the late 90s, what we had and what we worked with. And not that I'm not I'm not pulling the old I walk walked uphill both ways to school story, but things were different. We didn't have a lot of the the products and the aftermarket and the availability of uh, that kind of thing. I, I mean, I can remember photo etched casting marks. That was like a thing where you cut individual letters out of a photo etched sheet and cemented those on. And now we got guys that are 3, 3D printing them. So <laughs> yeah, I, I'm the same way. I remember back in the Stone Age, you know, when Verlinden was just coming out and stuff like that. And, yeah. you know, and we didn't have the communication level we do now where we could talk about, I, I hardly knew what photo etch was until you would see it and you're like, oh, what's that? Right. But there was no communication. There was no internet. So you weren't talking and it was it was really weird but uh it yeah, was yeah. yeah you know those days were fun don't get me wrong because that's you know everybody scratch built right but, uh, right it, that was you know when you had people that were the chef pains and all that were doing everything by hand but uh yeah. i want to bring up another thing real quick that um that we were talking about your your sixth year uh your steward um I, I know i i get there and i understand that completely <laughs> where you get to get that you, you jump on the kit right away but you know you say you're gonna um is that a goal for you to finish in 2023 or hopefully bring to national Nationals or something like that? Probably, yeah. Probably not national. Well, I'm going to say definitely not nationals. <laughs> and I would like to start it 
or I should say resume work on it this year. Mm-hmm. I probably won't finish it this year, but that's, that's a goal it, because it's number one, it's, it's big mm-hmm. and it's taken up space in my, my workshop. So it'd be nice to, to kind of get the box out of the way. And I think my, my interest in armor has kind of been reignited after going to nationals, uh, after participating in the group build. Yeah, that's kind of stoked the, the fire again in terms of getting some of those projects done and working on armor. I actually, I have plans. I booked a room. I'm going to go to uh, Amps Nationals this year in May, which really is only about an yeah, that's only about an hour from me uh, yeah. over near Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And I went back and forth. I, I'd love to go to MFCA. I've been to MFCA a few times. Great show, you know, phenomenal work. But I think I'm going to do the, uh, the, it's the same weekend. So, you know, one of those flip a coin type of things, but I'd really like to go back to amps uh, and get back involved with, with that group of people. Cause I had a lot of fun when I did it, you know, in the nineties the and two thousands. We know, especially guys. Oh yeah. When you're, when you're talking, you know, you haven't been back since the nineties. You're talking, you know, the quality of kids have changed. The, 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 yes. The, you know, and, the, and I'm the same way. I'm just like, I, if I, if I have to spend 45 minutes, you know, sanding a road wheel, I, I'm not going to do it anymore. I'll just go get my, right. I'll go get a tomato kit and just start working yeah. on that. And, uh, uh, but no, you're, you will enjoy it. If you go to amps, you know, it's great. It's a great motivator. Like all shows are. So yeah. Good. yeah, Jeremy, you mentioned, you mentioned amps and in, in the nineties and two thousands. I think it's really interesting, especially when you talked about aftermarket, you know, you walk around that, that single room vendor room and your aftermarket is like on the mark photo etch, which is probably thicker than a two yes. by four. Yes. Um, you had, I think the best stuff and it's still the best, some of the best casting. Do you remember Armin Bayardi? The oh, oh, yes. products? Yep. Yeah. So yeah. good. In fact, I, I have a, I have a Sherman in one of my cases that's, that's mounted on an Armin and Bayardi base that he nice. did that weigh it's solid resin that weighs like 14 pounds you know but <laughs> it's probably it's phenomenal sculpting. yeah yeah <laughs> oh man so also it's interesting you know i i'd love your take amps early 2000s i still think the quality from those shows could still hold up today i mean that was adam wilder absolutely yeah yeah some of the some of the highlights from that show is like adam's yeah. work were you at the show that douglas lee brought his dioramas yes Yes. So good. So So that's, that's, I'm glad you brought that up, JB, because they, I met him out at MasterCon. I don't know if you guys remember MasterCon. That was a contest oh, yeah. that was put on by uh, Bob Letterman VLS out in St. Louis in the late 90s, early 2000s. And Douglas Lee came, I want to say, in either 1999 or 2000 and brought a couple of his dioramas. One was, there was one, the, the Battle of the Golan Heights. Yeah, with the yeah. Guy, the Super Sherman dudes yeah, pushing the, the Jeep up. Pushing the, the Jeep Syrian. up the hill. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. It's got the PZ4 on top that's being captured and all that. Yes. Yeah, it's yeah. a great, I love that. Yeah. I think it's Hard Trail to Damascus or something yep. it's called. Yes. Yep. So I, I remember meeting him and, and having some conversations with him. And, and that whole scene for me was was one of those things that just turned things for me in terms of being interested in getting better and doing better and, and increasing the quality and the, you know, the time I spent on projects. Cause seeing that stuff was, was just unbelievable. MasterCon was a lot of fun. Cause I remember we got to shop in the warehouse oh, yeah. in the v, in the VLS warehouse. One of the days of the show, if you were, they had this like membership, you, you paid like 50 bucks a year. You got free shipping. If you remember they let you into the warehouse, house and said, have at it. So, I mean, there was a proverbial kid in the candy store and I bought <laughs> shit that I didn't need, but I just, it was there and it was in my hand and I'm like, oh yeah, I gotta buy it. It was and then going into downtown, I guess that was at the time it was in St. Charles, Missouri. Bob Letterman had uh, like a, almost like a miniature museum of his work and some of Francois Albert Linden's work. So that, yeah, there was those those were good, good, they are good memories of, you know, the hobby at the time and some of those people that were very influential in meeting some of those people. And I went to an airbrushing seminar at MasterCon that was put on by Chris Morosco. That's how I learned to use an airbrush. Basically, that seminar kind of was a turning point for me. Uh, I bought a Tamiya HG Superfine airbrush that I still have. I bought that in what, what this, so it's 20, 
23 years old, still use it. Uh, one of my favorite airbrushes. So yeah, it's just lots of good people, different show scene. I think that what you guys have done in terms of the podcast and getting people connected is huge. And, and, you know, those shows were fun, but they're not anything like what the atmosphere now is, I think, at a show. And a lot of that, uh, that credit goes to you guys for just kind of getting the word out. Hey, you know, introduce yourself to people, have a conversation, talk to, to people about what they brought, what they're building, what they're working on. That's, yeah, that's, I think that's a, a fantastic thing. And it's changed the hobby for me in so many good ways. So yeah, kudos to you guys for doing that. Well, we, we really, really appreciate it. And, you know, it's, you brought up some really great markers of that era. You know, uh, we talked with uh, Stan Spooner about Tamiya Khan and then Master Khan, you know, um, yeah. you know what great pillars they were, but yeah, I, I agree that the set, you know, social media has allowed collaboration and and really a sense of friendship across kind of the spectrum and and man we sure have a good time you know it's it's great being able to meet up with guys like you at Omaha the fact that uh, you came to participate in our group build that that's just that's just awesome you know you're you're somebody whose work I've admired and you know you know for a long time and so getting those opportunities to send you a Facebook message about you know <laughs> you know do a group build together that's amazing so um, we really appreciate you participating there. Let's talk about your social media and kind of where people are hearing us talk about all these models and everything. But if they're not familiar with your work, sure. uh, how, how can they find uh, pictures and, and photos of what you're doing? Yeah. So I have a, a Facebook page, uh, Scale Model Projects by Jeremy Moore. I try to keep that updated as, I, as I'm working on projects, post photos, uh, and just kind of you know share the, the things that I'm working on, the things that I plan on working on it's it's tough i'll i'll say given the the work life hobby balance i don't update it as much as i would like to or as much as i would hope to modeling for me kind of goes in fits and spurts and i think scott you and i talked about this at one point continuity for me is is hard when i go to work i i don't have the ability i'm not like martin drayton i don't know how martin does it man that guy can (laughs) no doubt the hotel the hotel modeling Um, that is unbelievable it It is unbelievable (laughs) yeah i i've tried it i just haven't been successful with it so when i'm on the road and i'm I'm on a trip i don't have the opportunity to to kind of keep projects going but i I try to keep that page updated as best as i can i'm shocked i've got 40 600 followers now, which I never, ever would have thought there would be that many people that would be interested in this dude that builds models. I mean, <laughs> that's the crazy thing about the hobby and social media. It, it's it's pretty cool. So yeah, that's where I, I try to keep things updated and and share the things that I'm working on. You know, and I have a bunch of people that I follow that that have influenced me. Uh, and I, I try to keep up to date with what they're doing as well, because it, it's always nice to to share and see what other people are doing. So we talked about, uh, you're talking about going to AMS this year. What what other shows are you trying to attend this year? Yeah. So uh, I had grand plans to go to the Old Dominion Open, but that's the weekend of one of my daughters is in a play. So that's, that's kind of out. Mosquito Con, that's the big uh, Northeast show. That's April 1st. New Jersey IPMS puts that on. Great show. You know, usually upwards of 500 entries. And it's a traditional IPMS show, uh, you know, one, two, three, that kind of thing. So it's, it's competitive and there's some fantastic work there. Great models. It draws a, a, a good crowd from all over the place, uh, all over the Northeast. Amps Nationals in, um, in May, I'll be attending that. I booked a room for uh, San Antonio, or I'm sorry, San Marcos for, for Nats this year. I'm going to go again. Awesome. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. And then there's another show in the Northeast in the fall, usually in like the first or second week of September, PenCon. That's put on by Central Pennsylvania IPMS. That's hosted at the U.S. Army Heritage Center in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And it's an awesome museum for armor and, and uh, military, specifically Army history. Uh, so great show, great show venue. So I'll be there. And then I'm going to try to make it to uh, PaxCon, which is going to be put on by the... Uh, the model geeks 
uh, in their club yeah, down in their uh, Maryland yeah. in October. So got that on the calendar and I really like to go down to that show and support those guys. Yeah. Um, that's, yeah. That's, that's a big one. I, I, that's some, I'm trying to clear my calendar for that one too, just to, yeah. you know, I just want to go down and see them again. And like you said, support them. And I need yeah. to time. Yeah. They came up to PenCon this, this past uh, September and had a chance to chat with those guys. And it was, it was a lot of fun. Uh, Jackson was there as well. That, you know, as usual, I, I shouldn't say as usual, Jackson style, he shows up like five minutes before the, the <laughs> entry window closes with like 10 entries and then he wins a bunch of gold medals. And then, and and then, then cleans up. Yeah. yeah. And I'm like, yeah. Yeah. Cleans up. Yeah, yeah, it's just, yeah. 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 <laughs> He's, well, yeah. I, I was a little bit late. Sorry. I only brought a few kits. Yeah. yeah, yeah exactly. You know. <laughs> Yeah, that the, and then the jaw drop ensued from what the guys looking at his work, and <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. Well, yeah, well, guys are just picking up their kits and putting a box in yeah. the boxes, you know. It's- yeah. Well, I want to kind of, I mean, if you can, uh, maybe talk about, uh, you know, kind of plans for projects for 2023. Yes. You sort of alluded to a couple of things, but what's yeah. on the bench? What's on your slate of goals? So I'm, I'm. Finishing up the uh, the Tamiya 148 scale P38. Uh, that's pretty close to being done. I've got a uh, an Edward 109 G14 that I'm I'm trying to finish, and it's just a battle of of the of me versus the kit and my will to finish it. It's one of those things that was almost like 99% done, and then I dropped a bottle of Mister Surfacer on the. Uh, on the, oh. the, the, the tail snap the tail off crack the fuselage but i can't i can't throw it away i probably should have i probably should have just tossed it oh but I, man i I can't. <laughs> so, my, my eyes, my eyes are watering yeah. right now. So I, I resurrected that, and I'm, I'm trying to finish that up as well, um, along with the P38. I've got a couple of projects that I owe to Kevin Futter from uh, KLP Publications. I've been talking with him for for quite a while about a couple of 132nd scale aircraft projects. He publishes their digital digital books. It's kind of a how to build series, or not? I shouldn't say how to build building the series so they he'll pick a subject building the 132nd scale hasagao f190 d9 that type of thing or building the special hobby tempest and he's got a group of guys that do phenomenal work so i reached out to him and got two projects that that uh, that i'm working on for him one is a hasagao uh 132nd scale bf 109 f and f Four and the other is it's a recent kit, the ICM Yak Nine. So those those two, which scale is that? Those that's one thirty second as well. Oh, yeah. nice! How, how does it look? Pretty good. That's a kit I'm potentially interested in. Yes, yeah, that ICM kit looks really nice, and it's it's a relatively simple airplane, and it, it's a simple airplane, but at the same time, it, there's some challenges in terms of weathering it because it's you know a lot of it is wood in terms of the wing, so kind of come up with some different ways to to make the surfaces look peeling and and not uh, monotonous because there's no rivets, you know, over a lot of the airframe, a lot of the wing and it's kind of the lack of surface detail presents some challenges, but I'm, I'm looking forward to that. It looks like a really nice kit. And then I'm working on a, uh, a sea fury for the, uh, the model geeks. They're doing the mid killer group build for Nats. So there's a, uh, a sea fury that famously shot down a MIG during the Korean war and I'm building the, uh, the Airfix kit. I know gasp air fix aircraft everybody kind of gets a little nervous but it's one of their nicer kits and then i got a ton of aftermarket to throw at that from barracuda studios uh they did a, a bunch of update sets a cockpit a new cowling landing gear that kind of thing so i was looking forward to that one as well that's that's Probably going to go next because August is not that far away. Some of the other, those, the other projects are more long-term, but I'm not real good about working on more than one thing at a time. I, I, I like to, but I find myself getting bogged down. So I, I, I don't like to say that I finished one thing and I move on to the next, but I, I don't really work on two things at the same time with, with the same amount of effort. So it, it's, that's just 
yeah, how I how I kind of do things. It's hard for me to to jump back and forth between two, especially if I get working and I'm and things are going well. I'd rather just keep going and try to get things finished up. And then a new kid will come out and I'm like, ooh, squirrel, shiny. I need to <laughs> I need to build it. <laughs> I, that to me, F35, Grant, you mentioned that. I pulled that out of the box, I don't know how many times in the last month. And I'm like, oh no, put it away. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I know one question we always ask our people our people we interview is you have all the time in the world you have all the money in the world you don't have to work this is your job now what is that magnus opus built what is that one thing you want to build or one diorama or whatever yeah no i i love this question and i always love the answers uh, i and i've thought about this mine has changed over the years and i'll say i've i have a an armor magnum opus project that i've i've been thinking about for a long time that's a, uh, a a white six by six truck with a twenty ton trailer with a a bulldozer on it. Oh, there you go. Yeah, That's it. yeah. So aim high, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> go go big or go home. And I have the the Hobby Boss whites. Uh, I guess the the six by six. I have a, a a PSP resin twenty ton trailer. One of those PSP resin kits that uh, I picked up years ago. That's really really nice. The missing piece is the dozer. I've, I've had the mini art kit and I've looked at that and I'm like, nope, not doing that. Too many damn parts. The <laughs> tracks are awful. So that's the, the, the an armor project. I've never really had an aircraft magnum opus. It, it's there's just there's too many airplanes that I like and I I, I can't I haven't been able to pin one down. But my diorama magnum opus is actually not far off. In fact, I've been gathering things to build the base and I've been gathering a lot of a lot of the stuff to do that that includes an airplane a downed a downed 109 that's being inspected by u.s troops so border models just came out with their 135th scale 109 g6 uh so i picked that up and i have a, a diorama scene in mind uh with this airplane and a an m8 armored car and a wc uh 62 kind of you know parked close to it with a bunch of guys examining it with some big pine trees and yeah that's my my, what my I, image <laughs> what i love about that idea more than the other two is it sounds like there'd be more figures and you need to do more figures yes that's and that's scott no you're absolutely right scott that's what draws me into that project even more is i want to paint some more figures because i really enjoyed it and i love painting you figures uh especially i love allied armor that's always been my thing so the idea of of including you know allied armor with an airplane it, it's just yeah it's something that i don't know five years ago ten years ago i would have thought would have been unobtainable because i didn't have the skill set to be able to do that because of the airplane thing um but now i think i could probably pull the whole thing together and, and make it look realistic and yeah, I, th I think you could. I mean, I, I mean, I feel like if you keep at this hobby, you've got a great future. I think you, you know you might be going somewhere. So. Just keep plugging away. Right? Plugging That's away. Right. <laughs> Well, That's you funny. know, um, Jeremy, this has been awesome. I, I it's I'm always amazed by these these calls. How much you know? How time flies. And um, oh, I know. I've just looked at the clock and I'm like, holy yeah, cow! Yeah, it's just <laughs> it was it was definitely worth the wait. But I can't wait to see you again. It sounds like at IPMS Nationals. Uh, one more time before we go, um, your Facebook page again for people, and and then anything else you want to say. Yeah. Uh, scale model projects by Jeremy Moore. And I just want to say thank you very, very much. I, I just think this is a fantastic thing that you guys have done with the Plastic Posse podcast, with uh, the social media aspect, uh, getting people together, getting people talking about the hobby, turning it into something more than, you know, the solitary thing that we do in our basements, in our workshops, occasionally going to a show, standing around and looking at other guys and kind of wondering what everybody's doing, that kind of thing. It's it for me personally, it has has significantly changed the way I look at the hobby and what the hobby is about. And that's, I think the most important thing is it's, it's not just about building models. It's about, you know, making friends, developing relationships, learning more about people. And that's the best part about it. I think that's, that's the, uh, the best possible outcome of this whole process that you guys have started. And it's fantastic. And I thank you for it. I thanks. I thank you for, you know, let me ramble on for, <laughs> for an hour and not, a half. No, not at all. It was fantastic. 
fascinating oh. and uh, really enjoyed it. And thank you for the kind words. You know, we just, uh, we have a great time. We love what we do. You know, we get a chance to meet great people like yourself and just have a great time. And, and honestly, this is a great hobby. And the fact that, you know, we can connect and collaborate and encourage each other and contribute to each other is just, it's the best thing about social media as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, Jeremy, thank you so much. Grant, any last last uh, mud balls you want to hurl at him before you let him go? <laughs> no, I just, like I said, I can't wait to see you at Nationals again. I, I really hope, you know, you bring that new zero that's on your page. That thing is beautiful. Thank you. Uh, that is amazing. And, you know, wish you the best of luck at, if you go to Amsterdam, like you're talking about and whatever show you is. And thank you so much for the kind words. We do really do appreciate it. Like, like Scott said, you know, we do this because we want everybody to be happy to enjoy this hobby more than they have in the past. So I appreciate that. We all appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. John sends his apologies. Uh, unfortunately, he's a very busy man. He had to step away, but he asked me to just let you know that it was, it was fantastic talking to you as well. So uh, Jeremy, thank you again for joining us. Thank you for supporting and being a part of, of our community. We really appreciate it. And uh, we will talk to you hopefully sooner than later. Sounds great. Thanks guys. I really appreciate it. Take care. That was great uh, catching up with Jeremy. He's such a such a really great modeler. You know, the first time I saw his work was that BF 109 that was on the cover of To Me a magazine, and and then it just seems like every armor kit and aircraft kit and everything he does since then is just amazing. I think from uh, what I'm seeing, if I'm reading the tea leaves right, he is going to be joining uh, most of the posse, if not all of us, in Denver for Commies Fest. So we're looking forward to that. I think the better question is who isn't coming to Commies Fest? I think a better question is who's not staying at John's house at Commies Fest? <laughs> yeah, I'm sorting that out. It's uh yeah, we might reach the legal limit for occupancy in the state of Colorado. And and parking next year, JB, you're going to have to start doing like a lottery, a lottery <laughs> system. Well, I'm not worried about parking, it's the bodies cuz a lot of people are flying in and then my wife is going to be out of town, so I I can fit four additional cars either in our driveway or garage. Yeah, it's going to be a blast. Hey, how about I how about I jump into feedback? How's that sound? Send it. Let's do feedback. Let's start with our good friend Ethan Eidenmill, who's a longtime deputy marshal. He writes in to say, "Hi, I just listened to your last show. Passion is a necessity since this is a hobby. I find that doing a project that ignites or maintains that passion goes smoothly, whereas projects without it tend to become shelf queens." The biggest thing I've found which sucks the passion out of a project is if I feel pressure to finish by something external. This is one reason why I never do commissions. I've also found that group builds have the same effect. For instance, I'm struggling right now to maintain momentum with my Maquette build, uh, particularly for that reason. Anyway, thanks again for the great podcast. Well, Ethan, I think uh, a lot of your <laughs> struggle with that particular build is you're building a Nitto uh, kit. And look, I love Nitto kits. Um, they're the original machining creator kits, but they're also really, really old. And uh, they are not as nice as what's available, you know, from Wave and Hasegawa. That's <laughs> released in this century. Yeah. But look, if you can, don't worry about it. You know, I've, I've been in group bills and if I don't finish, I don't finish it. I don't really care. At the end of the day, it's not, you know, it doesn't, doesn't matter, you know, do what's best for you though. I will say stick with it. The Nitto kits, you know, they're a little bit harder to build a lot bit har harder to build. They look really good when they're, when they're all built up, their proportions are a little bit better um, than, than the more recent wave kits. So, but yeah, I, I, I know how I feel. I've been there too. Yeah. And to go back to your point, Ethan, on passion, um, you know, obviously we covered a lot of that in the in the episode. But yeah, I just think that's that's really key. If if you're in a group build, it can be a lot of fun. There's a strong sense of esprit de corps. Uh, you know, you can get a lot out of it. But if you're just not feeling it, it's a hobby. So make sure it's fun. If it's not fun, do something else. So yeah, I think uh, 
we're right there with you. All right. Next, we have W.A. Bishop. Um, he recommends that we add timestamps to our podcast. Our last one was just over three hours. And he says it, may, it would make navigating easier if he can't listen start to finish at one point that if we had a place, a way to jump from spot to spot, he said that would be really, really good. He thanks us for uh, being open to the idea. Yeah, I mean, we've we've looked at that before. And I actually put timestamps into our uh, Telford episode because it was, uh, I think, pretty much the largest episode that we've ever done but anyway thanks for the idea and you know we'll you know take another look at it okay finally we have this is a big one so i'm gonna catch my breath um this is our good friend hendrick gauss he shared some fantastic insight into our topic from episode 62 balancing realism impressionism and enjoyment he says when i came back to the mo- to modeling six years ago i approached it from a historical accuracy perspective but over time i came to realize that i couldn't pull models off to my satisfaction using this approach I never had enough pictures of the same vehicle. They were usually blurry black and white shots anyway. Pushing for perfect historical accuracy also tended to kill any joy that I had for the hobby, and then modeling started to become a job. I tried to find a compromise between fun and my urge for realism and accuracy. A model is compromise, a tiny lump of plastic under artificial lighting, and therefore can't necessarily represent a 50-ton tank in a realistic way. I decided what I could do was make a model that feels authentic rather than one than one that is 100% accurate. Secondly, I decided to focus on one thing at a time, an authentic representation of a certain batch or tank of a particular unit. That doesn't mean I completely ignore realism, but I won't get troubled by tiny mistakes if they aren't the focus of the build. Thirdly, I tend to model the tank that came around the corner right after any reference photos were taken. It allows for some creative wiggle room while still doing an authentic representation of a specific unit or battle. For me, realism, true realism, is impossible. Authenticity is the way. Just prioritize one aspect of the model and prioritize accordingly. That's how I deal with realism versus creativity problem. Nailed it. Sorry, it's it's perfect. I mean, you can't you can't make a you know a perfect model. You can't make a perfect picture of you can't. He's doing you're doing it the right way. You're taking the examples, you're saying the next vehicle around the corner. That is perfect. You enjoying the hobby now. You're not getting yourself tied up in that one vehicle and that one picture, trying to figure out all the angles. Great job. I mean Look at Hendrick's work. Like he's he's got the formula nailed. Yeah. I mean, I'm lucky enough to have his Sherman in my cabinet. Yeah. That that's the benchmark. It makes everything mm-hmm. else in my cabinet look terrible. So he's he's got it. He he's yeah. got the perfect balance. He's just yeah, he's he knows his stuff. Oh yeah, definitely. I think I think at the uh the end of the day, and a lot of people probably disagree with me on this, and and I probably would have a couple of years ago too, but I've I've come around. But what we do, it it sounds pretentious, but it's art. Right. And probably a couple of years ago, I wouldn't have necessarily agreed with that. But as I've done more and and talked to more people, like we we all, it's an artistic endeavor that doesn't necessarily, I guess, make us all artists, but you're engaging in artistic endeavor and it's okay if it's not perfect because you know, like you guys said, it never will be perfect. I, I don't care how good you think you are. It's not going to be perfect. And, and that's okay. That's, that's great. That's, I mean, a human made it, so it can't be perfect, but yeah, just, just don't get bogged. To me, it's getting bogged down in the minutia isn't worth it to me. It, yeah, if you get enjoyment out of that, sure. But it sounds like most people that have said that stopped getting enjoyment out of it after a while. I, I haven't met anyone that's still like, oh no, I, I love getting bogged down in all the minutia on this one batch tank from blah, 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 blah. It, most people say, yeah, I did that. And then I realized it was killing my hobby. You know what I mean? As they get more involved in the hobby and try to push themselves to the next level. Like to me with that stuff, you can only get to a certain level and you can't go any further. That's it. Yeah. Haven't we all heard it said that uh, if you take the real thing and you shrink it down to whatever scale you're working in, it won't look right. It won't look as good as maybe a model of that same thing. That's, that's what I was thinking of when he was talking about the realism side. I just can't imagine that it would look right. You find somebody that thought it was wrong, even if it was the real thing. I like how he came back to the term authentic over and over. And, you know, it kind of reminded me of our discussions with Martin, you know, and, and he, he'll, he'll flat out say, I don't model usually to a historic photo because it sucks all the fun out of it for me. And he said that almost word for word, like Hendrick did, but yet you look at his work and it certainly is authentic. It certainly is representative of real life subjects just done kind of in an artistic way. And I think what Hendrick said really, really resonated 
resonates with me. And and like I said, with what Martin's told us on several occasions. Okay. Now remember that you can also send feedback and suggestions to us via email at plastic posse podcast at gmail.com. Thanks, Doug. The Triple P Mache Group build is sponsored by Bases by Bill. Bases by Bill specializes in making beautiful, crafted, wooden custom display solutions for your scale models, built by modelers for modelers. These premium quality display cases and innovative base designs are available for just about any size of model. These custom sized display bases range from 4 to 30 inches, providing the perfect foundation for dioramas or vignettes. As a reminder, if you don't see what you need, ask. Chances are they can customize the perfect solution for you. Check out Bases by Bill and see the new custom display products for bus and figures. Use the code POSSE, P-O-S-S-E, at checkout to apply a 15% listener discount to your order. Bases by Bill, for all your model display needs. All right, welcome back. We're going to take a quick look over at our Machine and Creator group build page. It's been a little quieter lately. Um, not too bad, but there's been some new stuff going on. I want to give a tip of the hat to our good friend Joshua Scott, who is finally getting back on his Mel, and he's making a little base for it. Looks pretty cool. The model itself looks fantastic. He did a really good job. Hopefully, by the time this is out, he'll have that base done. Lynn Young has started to put paint on, I want to say it was... The Hornet, and it's green, like ridiculously green. For a reason, he's modeling it after a World War One bi- German biplane. And uh, if you've ever seen some of the camo schemes the Germans had for their aircraft in World War One, there's a lot of like bright greens and purples and weirdness going on. Actually, Brian uh, Brian Krieger's done a suit in a scheme like that. It looks really cool. Yeah, he's got that going on. Speaking of Brian Krieger, he posted his Sea Pig split suit that is fantastic of course jb has got to see it in person and it looks awesome without paint on it so i know once he slaps the paint on it, it's gonna look even better but i'm a big fan of split suits he actually gave me i think three different ones um that i have in a little bag so i'd like to maybe do one of those soon but he's gonna knock it out of the park i'm not i mean he's great that's all you, that's all you need to say about brian and our good friend cliff is still plugging away on his Mark 44, but it looks awesome. And he did a little <laughs> Easter egg just for me. The uh, little fuel tank that goes on the back that's like kind of strapped under everything. He painted it in burgundy and gold, which is the colors of my favorite football team. The Washington Commanders, as they're now known. So I, uh, <laughs> I told him I approve and uh, I'd rather look at that than actually watch my football team on TV because they're terrible. So I am <laughs> I'm happy that he's uh he's man, he's knocking that one out of the park. It's gonna look so good when it's done. JB, tell us about some upcoming shows and events we've got. Yeah, thanks, Jensen. The plastic posse will be all throughout the country in the months of February and March. Our first show that we want to highlight is Mont Fiesta, Alamo Squadron's International Contest of Texas, held at New Braunfels, Texas Civic and Convention Center on February eleventh. This is the same team that's going to be putting on the IPMS Nationals this summer, and I'm super excited for them. I hope their local show goes well. I'm sure it will. They have a top-notch crew. It'll be an all-around great show with a lot of great modelers attending. The next show I want to highlight is the Northwest Scale Modeler Show, Model Mania at the Museum of Flight in Seattle, Washington. This is on the 18th and 19th of February. A strong contingent of the Plastic Posse will be there. Myself, Scott, Grant, and then a bunch of others that we've featured on the show before will be in in our company. It should be an absolutely fantastic event. Looking at getting an Airbnb. It's at the museum. If you bring a model, it's free entry. If not, simple admission to the museum will do. It's an all-around world-class collection of aircraft, all the way back to World War One, to the most recent uh, jets that are outside, and then also the M21 inside. It's just a super cool venue, to be honest. I think the picture of all the models under the M21 uh, stands out in my mind as the best venue for a model show, period, full stop. And Jim Bates is the show organizer. It's going to be a lot of fun. I'm going to be giving a seminar on rolling tarps, and then Scott is going to be co-hosting a seminar with the Rick Lawler. So... That'll be exciting. Yeah, looking forward to it. Honestly, the the show couldn't be in a better venue. Like you said, JB, it's worth the trip just to go to the museum. The curator's a great friend of the Northwest Scale Modelers, and he's a modeler himself. He was on our show last year. So uh, if you're in that area or you can make it, come on up. In addition to that, we have the Atlanta Military Figure Society show at the Hilton Atlanta Northeast on February 17th and 19th. TJ, I believe you're going to that one, right? I am going to that one. I fly in um, Friday afternoon, and yes. uh, Mr. Mark Sprayberry has arranged transportation for me 
from the airport to the hotel. And uh, yeah, it's going to be, I'm really looking forward to it. I also believe Jackson and Zach are driving down to the show. So I think the last time we talked about it, they were going to be there. I told them they're more than welcome to sleep in my hotel room, but I only got one bed. So they're going to have to wrestle for it. And uh, yeah, it's going to be fun. So the next weekend after that, are you going to the Old Dominion Open as well? I am. Yeah. So I got a busy February. Um, Jackson and I will be driving down to that one. I'm going to go pick them up and uh, because I pass, I drive more towards his way to get to that one. And uh, yeah, we're going to drive down to that. I believe the geeks are going to be there. They usually are. Um, Yeah, it's going to be fun. We're going to look at some sweet models, buy some cool stuff and eat some good mexican food and uh yeah i can't wait that's gonna be a long it's gonna be a long week for me i I fly to atlanta the week before and then back drive down to north carolina to work or drive back home the day later i'm gonna drive down to richmond which i pass through on my way home from from north carolina it's just a turnaround to come back the same day so yeah but it's all worth it man totally worth it Hell yeah, that sounds like a great time. After that, we go into March and we have a virtual, I wouldn't say contest, but gathering. It'll be for the Models Officer Mess 48 and 48 group build for Models for Heroes. It is the March 10th and 11th. It's online. Anyone's welcome to join. We'll be hosting a large portion of the U.S. segment. I just checked my eBay order and it is sitting in my mailbox. It is a 3D printed tank in 48 scale. So I am super excited to start that. And then after that, it really comes into really Oh gosh, three great shows. So the first I'll talk about is Commies Fest. We've mentioned that before. It is on March 25th here in Denver, Colorado, at the Wings of the Rockies Exploration of Flight Facility, which is on the which is on the property of the Centennial Airport. So super close, at least to my place. I know there's a lot of people nearby as well. It should be a, a grand time. The venue is nice. They have I want to say double the vendors as last time almost, which is pretty sizable. And then we're gonna have two tables. You know, BJ from Panzer Concepts might bring some. Stuff up to sale to sell i've asked mark um bradley uh jamie his wife has a barbecue business i think they're going to bring some products as well to put on our table of course there'll be funfetti there might even be a jensen and it should be a rather grand time there will be barbecue at the event via food truck might even have a dessert truck so and i know they're trying to do seminars so bottom line is the show is expanding and it's going to be a lot of fun it's always great Brian Krieger, you know, I hope he wins. Last year, it was difficult on him, to be honest. But, you know, I'm, I'm, we'll see. We'll see. But anyway, all jokes aside, Brian Krieger will be there, Machine Krieger. Please come just to see his work. It is well worth the trip just for that. And he's working on a lot of new stuff, and we can't wait to see it. Hopefully, I'll have that split suit done by then. In addition to that, we're very sorry we cannot attend IPMS uh, Hamilton's Heritage Con 15. These are the nice folks that put on the Musaru Cup. It'll be displayed there. I'll be sending in pictures, unfortunately, because it is the day after Commies Fest. And unfortunately, it's in Toronto. We're here in Denver. And th- that's another venue, Canadian Warplane Heritage. If you're on the East Coast, make the drive up. Absolutely fantastic time. Alan and his team do a bang up job. And I wish I could have gone. I think we all do. And then lastly, we want to highlight MFCA, May 5th and 6th at the Radisson Hotel in Philadelphia. And TJ, you're going to that one too? Yes. Almost 100% confirmed going to be at that one. Yeah. Really looking forward to that too. I think that is the largest figure show in the United States. States, according to Barry, I think it's that one, then MMSI, and then the Atlanta show is a close third. He said actually, like it, the Atlanta show and MMSI are comparable in size. MMSI might be a little bit bigger, but yeah, those those are the three big ones. And if I can hit two this year, I'm going to be a happy camper. Yeah, MFCA, I've always wanted to attend. That's where internationals come in. The best in the world come to it. It's it's really crazy what they can do with a figure show that's only two days long and and draw that much attention. So super jealous of that. That's great. So uh, the last show I want to highlight is the IPMS Nationals. It will be from August 2nd to August 5th in San Marcos, Texas. This should be a rather grand event. I do want to share some news. The show is going to have a large participation from Tamiya, which is unheard of, unseen before. They have really stepped up to support IPMS USA. Super excited for what we have planned for them. I'm on the show committee. We have details to be released soon, but it is it is going to shape up as something that uh, you're definitely not going to want to miss. So buckle up. It's going to be an awesome time in San Marcos. We'll be there. I think every other podcast will be there. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll hide jack their booth again and use their equipment put some class to it yeah no it should be a really great time all jokes aside if you can make it san marcos is your uh, is the spot to be this august 
All right, before I hand off the mic, I'm going to just give you a polite reminder that you can check out our merch page and get your best Plastic Posse swag. Many of you already ordered from the uh, from the merch store, including coffee mugs, t-shirts, jumpers, and even some official lounge trousers. And we want to thank you so much for that support. If you're a Patreon supporter, be sure to look for the discount code that's on Patreon. Uh, we try to keep those prices as low as possible for our supporters. And you can order this stylish merch from the plastic hyphen posse hyphen podcast dot creator hyphen spring dot com. We'll put a link in the show notes. No need to write it down. And with that, back to you, Jensen. Has your stash become monstrous? Need cash or maybe some extra space? Or maybe looking to grow your collection? Trying to find that special or unique kit? Whatever your needs, check out hobbyswap.com. That's hobby-swap.com. Did we mention that Hobby Swap, you can list as many models as you want to sell for free? That's right, unlimited free listings. They also have lower price listing fees than any of those big named auction sites. And it's easy to use. Posting a kit for sale takes as little as 30 seconds. Hobby Swap Swap.com. It's like going to a model shop every time you log on. Check out hobbyswap.com today at hobby, H O B B Y dash swap, S W A P.com. So now I want to go into our next discussion topic. Uh, and this is one I think we've all suffered from. I know I currently am going through it. I know Zach Grizzle, our good friend, is going through it as well. And it's how do you regain confidence if yours has been shaken? And why do you, why do experienced modelers lose their confidence also? But I am going to also caveat that as to how, when we're feeling really confident, how that also has an effect on our model. Because I don't want it to be all doom and gloom and a pity party of, oh, we're suffering at the minute, please boost my ego. It's also going to be a, hey, I'm feeling great. And this is the outcome of that feeling. But I'm going to, a bit like before, I want to go around the room. I'll go last because I've spoke more than enough this episode. I want to throw this to Captain Confidence himself. JB, go on. Uh, that's a great question. I think we all lack confidence at some point, whether it's in the hobby or or life. And how I regain confidence is is, is simple steps, simple little wins. I start by writing some things down and try to chip away at it. And I hate to say it, but you regain confidence by sharing your work and getting engagement with the community. I think the easiest way to get out of a funk is to feel proud about something. And one way to do that is to garner some likes. I know it's maybe trivial or superficial, but at the end of the day, it helps. When, when you post something online, you get people to react to it, whether it's a like, love, comment. And I think that's super important. And, and that's one of the reasons why I try to be prolific online is because it, it helps. It, it really helps. It kind of gives you a uh, it gives you a boost. It gives you an improved self-confidence. It, it, it shows some, maybe some, even some validation. I know that's hard to say with validating the hobby and all, but um, a little bit of validation to your work is never a bad thing. Positivity around the hobby, being supported, supporting others is 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 the name of the game in my book for for having fun and 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 feeling a sense of accomplishment so i think regaining confidence is a is a combination of things both internally and externally so internally writing those things down having small wins putting something on your shelf that's finished or even minor steps in a build it doesesn't necessarily have to be finished i should say because it, it kind of goes back to what we've always said is that fun and those external factors as well the community and the friends you keep and the work that you share and get get engagement from them so from my perspective that's that's confidence you know maybe i'll go with a tactical example of this you know i lost a lot of confidence in airbrushing probably 10 years ago and i think i've told this story before where I'm painting to Mia, it dries before it gets to the surface, and I'm left with chalk. And that can destroy your confidence for even one simple technique that should be airbrushing and that everybody should be able to do. But the fact is, us modelers struggle with simple things. So what did I do? I literally started reading, writing things down, and testing things. And what was the resolution? Just a little bit of to Mia clear in there. And once you hit that, you get you in your stride. And then you can go finish something. So long story short, internal, external factors, try to be positive, I think, at the end of the day in both of them. So uh, uh, I'm probably no different than anyone else. I've had my confidence shaken. The, the, the worst time probably ever was 2021 Nats. I didn't I didn't expect to win anything uh, with my armor. I felt like I could. Um, I thought I brought really good work and. I've said before, winning model or winning trophies isn't the goal of the hobby, but you know what? It feels good. I can't deny that I like to get a trophy. Um, I'd be a liar if I did. And I was really hoping I would, I would bring one home for my, one of my many, many armor pieces that I brought and I did not. And, uh, yeah, that it didn't make me want to quit modeling or anything like that, but you know, I, I was a little shook because I'm like, man, I, I thought my armor was pretty good. I mean, I've been in a magazine, you know, I've got people that, 
tell me they like it on you know the internet like i thought i could walk home with the trophy and i and i did not not for my armor i did for some other stuff that i brought that i brought because I, oh i had space in my bag i'm just gonna throw this other stuff in there because again any given sunday which we've said before but yeah it stung and it really did and i was like man is is my arm it is it not that good like i, I thought it was kind of good like right i thought it was okay at least and uh, it took a little bit took a couple builds to kind of like get that going again to be like no 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 you, you know what you're doing like you've, you've done this a bunch of times like there was better stuff there and that's okay that's and there may be next year too it it was rough it was i tried to act like it didn't bother me but it definitely bothered me and it did it shook my confidence because i was like wow i kind of see myself as an armor builder like a pretty competent one but man maybe i'm not and um i still like to think that i am so I, i've recovered but uh yeah it was it was a little rough i'm not, not even gonna lie what about you grant uh you know it, I'm I'm like I guess 2018 I went to nationals in Phoenix I think it was and uh, I uh, was really kind of new into figure painting but I thought I did some good work because I had won some awards out here and then I went out there and just walked around the tables and I was one of those moments where you just wanted to pull your stuff off the table and uh, that shook me pretty hard you know that's you, you think you're pretty decent and then you you see something that really 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 is good flat out good but my wife. Um, when I came back and I told her about it, she's like, you know, you've only been doing this a little while. You know, what do you expect? You, how long have you been building other things? And you, you know, just learn from that, you know, learn from that and, and go on. And, you know, that was like, I guess, like TJ and JB said, that's, you know, there's sometimes you need to get that cold water in your face to get that going on. You know, so I want to turn this to the other side, though, because we talked about not making this Debbie Downer episode. When you have confidence, I think when I do, I mean, I, I notice that my build quality go or quantity goes up because I'm just I seem like to be in a uh, a positive frame of mind. I'm, I'm thinking about what I want to do. And, and, and uh, the paint hits the figure or paint hits the model and it just everything is perfect, you know, and everything is going really well. And that's when I can tell that I'm really doing, I'm, I'm confident in that aspect. Um, that's probably the biggest, best way I could tell. You know, we all like the likes, like JB said, you know, it's, it's, when you're positive, you're positive all the way around. I just think it's one of those things where your positivity will help everybody else in your group or your friends or your page or whatever. And you start to see everybody getting better. And uh, I think that's that's important. So kind of going with what Grant was saying, I used, I used to kind of be like that. Like, oh, I don't want to do this kit because I, I'm not good enough or I don't think I can do it. Now I just... I just don't care. There, there's no kit behind me that I wouldn't pull out right now and build and feel like I could probably do a pretty good job on it. Same thing with when I started painting like large scale figures. The first thing I did was like, I'm not going to worry about if I screwed up. Okay, who cares? Yeah, just kind of paint bravely, I guess. To uh, that's another podcast about miniature painting, which is it's pretty good. If anyone hasn't listened to it, I, I recommend it. But that's the name of their podcast. And that's kind of their thing. Like, no, just go out and do it. And if you feel like your confidence is wavering a little bit, just it's easy to say. But but once you can get yourself to do it, and you look back at it, you're like, wow, that was a good choice, right? That was easier than I thought it would be to kind of kind of get myself there. You just you have to have a little wherewithal, I guess, and just say, no, I can do this. I, and I will not, I can do this. I will do this. And that's with like anything in life. But um, as it pertains to the hobby, it's definitely feasible because at the end of the day, there's no real drawback, right? If you screw up, what do you really lose? Nothing typically, unless it's hard to completely destroy something, right? So even if you mess up the paint or the build, I just get another one or strip the paint off of it and do it again or throw it in the trash. I mean, who cares? It's a, it's it's a literally a toy. So just, just go, man. Just go. Don't not do something. Yes, yeah, that's, that's a good point. What about you, Doug? Because I know this is something that's quite relevant to you at the minute. Yeah, I, I struggle with confidence a lot. Um, not just, you know, in a lot of things that I do. Model building is one of my favorite pastimes. Maybe the favorite pastimes that are handling, you know, playing with the reptiles. But uh, I, I had fall into the trap of comparing myself to others. And, the, and that can be kind of rough. And I've got to remind myself that that's not what it's about. I'm not doing this for someone else. And I'm really not doing it for other people's approval. Although going and dropping something on Facebook and getting a lot of likes and a lot of people complimenting you is, is definitely a plus. But I stay away from, I try to stay away from comparing my, my builds. The good thing about comparing myself to other people is that's when I start, when I see other people do things that I'm not able to do, that's when I start asking those questions, how do I do it? 
And I mean, I've got some ideas. I just did uh, a couple months ago, my first uh, German three-tone camo and I was okay with it, but then I see what other people are doing and I just think, man, well, mine's pretty, pretty plain. And, and I wasn't real, I'm not real happy with it now, but now I've asked enough questions that I, I'm confident that my next one, which has already got the uh, base coat on it. I've got a, a, a late, uh, late model tiger ready to go. Um, I think it'll come across a lot better. So yeah, I get down, but I try to uh, try to allow that to build me up. That's that's just uh, the best I can do. Yeah, um, something I think we're all guilty of is comparing ourselves to others. Uh, it's I think weirdly within our nature to do that. Look at what other people are doing and be like, "Hmm, I'm not doing that. Why?" Uh, it's it's just I don't know, Scott. What's your perspective on this? It's uh, I mean, first of all, it's a it's a, a really great question. So uh, kudos to you uh, for bringing this to the table. I think moving on to the second part of the question first, why do modelers lose their confidence? I mean, uh, you guys have all had really great perspectives on that, and I'm going to go back to something that uh, our our own esteemed Mr. Mayberry addressed with um, somebody that gave us feedback last uh, episode, which was you know somebody that was frustrated because they weren't productive at their bench, but they were. Just just coming out of the military that had a couple of moves. And I, I think real life is a factor in what we do. If we're struggling in our job, if we're tired, if we're, you know, spending a lot of time commuting or having meetings or whatever, I think I think that affects us. And 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 then that sort of rolls over into something that I think our own esteemed Mr. Howler talks about a lot, which is the need to complete projects and to keep to keep that going because each time we complete a project, even if it isn't absolutely perfect, I think that contributes to our confidence. And so I think those are really good points those guys made as far as how do you regain confidence if, if yours has been shaken. Uh, something that I like to do um, when I'm struggling at my bench is offer to help offer to help another modeler with something that you still are confident in. You know, I've been collaborating with a friend of ours on on a build kind of behind the scenes and you know just you know we've been sort of talking about things and trying to help any way that I can and for me when I'm helping somebody else that makes me kind of feel more confident in what I'm doing and makes you know makes me want to get back uh, to my projects on the bench. So that's an idea that I have is just try and lend a hand if you can. That's 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 a good way of looking at it. Like you say, you, you it's like you know, it's like you're being involved whilst directly not being involved in your own project. So you, you you're providing stuff and working on stuff while not you're not your own stuff. So you you're still accomplishing stuff whilst not worrying about it being yours. That's that's a good. So the whole reason this this came to mind is because I know myself and Zach at the minute we we've nothing like confidence wise. There's nothing left in the barrel. There seems to be this issue, and I don't want to speak for him because he's not here, but. We've gone through a period where we've been working on projects, said projects haven't been getting finished, more and more shelf queens develop, and we're going along and we're doing all this work with very, there's nothing to show for it at the end because nothing's getting finished. And obviously we see finishing something as a, an accomplishment, as a, pro, a project's done, so we've achieved it. We're going through the process of just building stuff with no finished project at the end, and because this is going on so much, we're starting to find errors and mistakes in our modelling, which is then resulting in more confidence being lost obviously with confidence it it, it takes qu quite a long time for to build it and seconds to shatter it so with projects that we're doing we're just it's just not going right it's not going well there's there's errors or something's gone wrong and now it's got to the point i think for both of us we were talking about this the other night where we're not even wanting to start anything brand new over the fear of messing it up before we've even started like we're, we're, we're thinking of the errors we're already going to do and obviously no confidence breeds overthinking and self-doubt so there's a lot of that at the minute. It's, and it's not easy to get it back. So that's th this is where I kind of wanted to get this conversation going because granted mine's slowly returning having worked on this tack and kicks i've really forced myself to work on it i just know that zach's not having a great time at the minute because very much like me he was thinking there's nothing i want to do i have no inclination to model because anything i do i'm probably gonna mess up some way and it's, it's just hard to get that confidence back now to caveat all that when your confidence is high and you're rolling with it it's like what grant said the, the amount you produce goes up 
exponentially. The projects you do, the quality of them, the amount of time you spend at the bench, it all just, everything goes right. My peak confidence was when I was working on Desolate. I was doing the rust effects. Everything just went right because I was confident. Where that confidence came from, I don't know, because like I said, it takes a long time to build it, seconds to shatter it. This is one of those kind of discussions I don't have an answer for. It's I definitely, I loved hearing all your perspective. I definitely like to hear the community's perspective because confidence is, and it's not just modeling. Confidence is anything, playing an instrument, being a singer, being an actor, do anything in life, even driving. If you're not confident, it's hard. It's really hard. And it's why I wanted to kind of bring the other perspective in when you are confident. Because like I said, I don't want it to be a, a, a part where we're saying we're not confident in our modeling and then kind of seeking praise because I know a lot of a lot of our listeners do look look at us as modelers like good modelers like we 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 do inspire people and I don't want to I don't want that to sound showy off your arrogant but I know our work does inspire people so I don't want it to sound like um oh my stuff's not good because I know my stuff can be really good it's just having that confidence you, you know, uh, Jensen, you br- you bring up a good point, and uh, you know, you talk about working on that Tacom uh, Sturmgeschütz. You know, it's a it's a great little kit and everything. And and I think another strategy if we're if you're struggling a little bit with your confidence is you know kind of going back and and doing a couple of different things might help. You know, first of all, um, if you're overcomplicating a build, which you know, some of us tend to do where we're shaving off parts of the kit and we're af- adding a whole bunch of aftermarket. You know, maybe we back away from that a little bit, you know, and, and until our confidence returns. And then something that I think, I think it was Josh Buck when he was on with us, he talked about, you know, um, writing down like journaling builds and, and breaking the builds into kind of bite sized pieces. And so creating a plan, uh, for a project. And, you know, I think that could really help your confidence because then you can maybe identify, hey, these 10 things, I'm cool with those, but you know, it's these other two things here that I'm really struggling with. And so maybe you can, you know, use that plan to maybe create a, a way around it or maybe approach it in a, in a little different way. Or maybe you can, you know, get on the bat phone and say, TJ, I'm really struggling with this modulation. Can you, can you give me a hand with it? Here's some pictures of, of where I'm at, you know, kind of a thing. But if you break it into, instead of this giant big, oh, I can't finish this model. I don't like it. If you can break it into little pieces with you know what you're struggling with maybe maybe that can help but anyway like like i said really really great question i think it's a good discussion i've enjoyed it well thanks guys that was a great discussion thank you to our listeners our guests our sponsors our castmates and we invite listeners to comment or post pics based on our discussion points remember in two weeks we'll have another great interview and some great discussion points we look forward to talking to you then take care and yeehaw All right. Well, now it's time to do a shout out to our fantastic Posse Outriders. Uh, These are people that support what we do on Patreon and help bring this show to you. We really, really appreciate the support. If you would like to support the Triple P and become a Plastic Posse Outrider, just go to our Patreon page at www.patreon.com forward slash Plastic Posse Podcast, and you can set up a recurring donation there. This helps us to offset the cost of bringing you the Triple P. There are three different tiers of support, and those start at just a buck a month. All right, and we'd like to thank our Deputy Marshals, Ryan Smith, Terry Wilkinson, Chris Lovewell, Andrew Callis, Ethan Eidenmill, Bruce the Model Noob, Steve Baker, Eric DeGleish, Joe Porsche, Graham Pearson, Patrick Brown, Steve Schaefer, Jay Kidd, 
Paul Burdett, Brandon Gentry, Robert Klein, Mark Ewing, Ted Kawahara, Josh Orr, John Bryan, Scale Model Hanger, Toad Man, Model Doc, Doug Reed, Greg James, Les Wercala, B. Colt 1911, John Everett, Josh Buck, Black Rifle Model Works, Thomas Bannock, Mark Bradley, Zach Pease, Joel Munson, Eric Brubaker, Jeremy Moore, DB Scale Model Studio, Matt Johnson, Jared Cowell, Jeremy Elliott, Mike Talley, Previous Seat, Mediocre Middle-Aged Modeler, Dan Nofel, and J.C. Osborne. And now our excellent posse foreman, John, Jeremy, Cliff, Rick, Eric, Mike, Alex, Benjamin, Craig, Papa Steve, Logan, Red Beach One, MD Models, The Voice of Bob, JV, Pete, Toby, Matters of Scale, Damian, Kareen, Cody, Papa Mike, Charlie, Tim, Forest Ghost 73, Nuke Man Mike, Greg, J.A.K., M.A.K. Armor, Ash, Irish Pat, Paul, What's the Deal with Eye Bones Models, Mr. Grizz, Jackson, Chris, Lee, 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 Jamie, and Steve. That's a tenacious D reference in case anyone. (laughs) Our posse outriders include Simon, Lynn, and Warren. Also, we would ask the posse members for a favor. Please consider posting a review of the Triple P on the podcast platform you are listening to and Facebook. Each five-star review will help other bottlers find the Plastic Posse. Also, if you haven't already, please join the Plastic Posse group on Facebook. It's a great place for a community to interact Post bill picks, ask questions, and just hang out. They'll be fine. No. I always hear that it's cheaper the last minute you book. It's not. <laughs> not. It's not. That, it's that's not. a lie. Just like yeah. the plane will wait for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just... Can we talk about how Twinkies are really Does anybody give it any chances? I don't know if you watched the first season, but um, um, The Bad Batch. Has anybody mm-hmm. checked it out? No, I have not. No. Nope. Um, I like the first season okay. The second season so far is kind of, kind of blah. Um, but they have some of those AAT, the tanks that uh, like like JB built, and dude, there's stowage on them. It, it's cool. They've got like all kinds of netting and and tarps and and, and boxes and stuff. I I thought that was. I, I'm like you. I really liked uh, the first year, but haven't really been able to get into it year two. I haven't watched anything. Really, no. I don't watch the television. Other than I watched RRR, which was awesome. It's an Indian movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've seen the, the trailer for it. I haven't watched it's, it. Um, it's hilarious. It's really, really good, actually. And the action is, is fantastic. Um, it's about two, um, two real... It's based on two... Well, it's not. It's totally fantastical. But two Indian revolutionaries in the early um, 20th century. It's two different revolutionaries that didn't know each other in real life. And this movie um, pretends that they did. And they, they're essentially like superheroes. Uh, obviously, they weren't in real life. But at, at one point, one of them throws a tiger at a British soldier. And uh, it's pretty awesome. I would have never thought to do that. But maybe that's how they won their independence. I don't know. I wasn't there. So I can't confirm. <laughs> that's a pretty big cat to pick up and throw. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, it's a really good movie. It's um, The English dub is okay, I guess. Um, unfortunately on Netflix, you can only, you, you can get an English dub or Hindi dub, but the original Mm -hmm. language is not Hindi. It's like Telugu or it's another language they speak in India that they make their own movies too. in that language, just like, you know, Bollywood makes it in Hindi. So me personally, I like watching foreign movies in their language with English subtitles because dubs 
usually suck. So, <laughs> like, I watched Squid Game in Korean because the English dub was yeah. terrible. Oh, they I, are so bad. Yeah. I watched the first episode. I was like, this is stupid. This show is interesting. I like this, but the English dub is freaking terrible. And then I switched it to Korean with the subtitles. I'm like, this is much better. I don't understand <laughs> what they're saying, but at least it looks like they're saying it. I, I agree. I mean, you know, movies like one of my favorite all time movies is Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. But I saw it in the theater with subtitles, and the first time I tried to watch it dubbed, I almost started laughing. It's just terrible. Yeah, yeah. the the dub on that movie sucks too. It's yeah. so much better in Ma- Mandarin. I, I, I think so. I think that's yeah. what they speak in that movie. It's, yeah, it's I haven't Mandarin. seen that movie in probably like fifteen years. Yeah, it's so good. It's a really beautiful film. And speaking of which, I, I believe Michelle Yeoh was nominated for Best Actress for Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. So if she wins that, that would be awesome because she's fantastic. And she was so good in Crouching Tiger. Yeah, she's she's incredible. I like I like pretty much everything she's ever been in. So she, She's one of the rare act- actresses that, that actually gets me to want to see a movie just because she's part of it. Yeah, yeah I uh, agree. I love her to death. And everything, every, everything, everywhere, all at once was really, really, really good. Highly recommended if you haven't what's, watched it. What's that about? The multiverse. It's it's uh, about everything. Yeah, everywhere, it's, it's all about at once. every. That's really what it's about. <laughs> uh, she plays a second uh, second generation Chinese immigrant, and she owns a laundromat, and then she's in trouble with the IRS, and then her husband played by um who i can't remember his name he played short round in temple of doom and pretty much hasn't been in really any movies since until now and he's fantastic i think he was nominated for a he um, won a gold in, yes yes he did and he deserved it because he's so good in that movie but um there's like a multiversal group of people that are trying to stop this evil thing from destroying the multiverse so they think they find her because she's the one that can do it so it's doesn't make a whole lot of sense describing it but i promise it's really good that's it i mean that's it it's a multiversal thing and there's sweet action scenes and it's really funny and also sad and just just really 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 good and jamie lee curtis is fantastic in it jensen you all right buddy yeah sorry i'm split screen i'm split screening <laughs> I, I got to dig on the Brits and you didn't say anything. I was trying to get a rise out of you. Oh, the, oh shit. Yeah, anyway, it's fine. <laughs> Grant, Grant, what have you been watching? Not really too much, to tell you the truth. I mean, you know, between work and everything else, I watched um, just, I, I've been watching a lot of older movies. I watched, um, uh, I watched, uh, I can't believe I can't remember the name right now. Uh, Oh, uh, the Star Wars, the, the the one we all love. Andor. Um, yeah, I watched Andor. I watched that. But then I went back and watched the I watched uh, the Rogue movie. One. Rogue, Rogue one. one. Yeah. Because a friend of mine said, watch Andor season one, go back and watch Rogue One. Watch Andor two, season two, go back and watch Rogue One. And you'll find stuff in there that it, it, it makes the movie more interesting if it's possible and it is i mean there's some really interesting keys that you find out in there you know like i've been fighting the empire since i was six years old you know things like that you know that he says and it's just it was it's been pretty interesting watching going back and reading stuff like that and seeing stuff like that so it's you know it's that, that i found that very interesting uh to do that so are you up to date on the last of us mm-hmm yeah, episode three was people. I, I I loved it. I I thought it was probably that that was that was unbelievable. Uh, I was almost brought a tear to my eye. It really it did. Was, it, it made me. I did. I'm not even yeah. gonna lie. Yeah, though, it was though. It was also had some of the funniest lines. Oh yeah, yeah. like when <laughs> when Frank and Bill are arguing and he's like, <laughs> Bill, there's there's always conspiracies with you and you know 911 was an inside job and the government's yeah. run by nazis like yeah but the government is run by nazis well, well i mean they are now but they weren't back then i laughed so hard yeah it's like it, when he drank the bottle of wine he goes did you put it in the wine he's like oh i put enough in there to kill a horse or whatever it was that was, God, it was so good oh so good huge, so huge good. huge departure from the game too like, yeah mass, and that's what i was explaining to my wife i'm like that is oh, yeah not at all what happens in the game yeah frank, that, that, frank, frank isn't in the game but like no nope. definitely is mm-hmm. 
Yeah, and it was then, like, um, yeah, was oh, so God, that was so good. Great job, Jensen. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, that was um, really yeah, good, was Jensen. Good, good job. Thanks, Hamburger. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah, I noticed. <laughs> <laughs> All right, keep going on that Sturm Geschutz, uh, Jensen, and uh, you guys take care. Hi, Adios, amigos. Night all. Yes. Night all. Thanks, guys. Yep.